Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Sunday, December 9th, 2012. This is episode 934. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it, right from your desk. To get our special offer, visit Stamps.com now, click on the microphone, and enter Tech Guy. And by Go to meeting with HD Faces from Citrix, the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with colleagues and clients from anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face to face with HD video conferencing, even from an iPad. Sign up for your 30 day free trial today. Visit gotomeeting.com, click the try it free button, and use the promo code TECH. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time to talk about computers and the internet and cell phones and camcorders and MP3 players and MP3 players and uh, digital photography. Our photo guy, Chris Marquardt, joins us momentarily. 33 past the uh, second hour. Our myth, he's a photographic myth buster lately. He's going to bust another photography myth. You want to join the conversation? You're welcome to do so, and there are a variety of ways to do that. Of course, we have a phone number I mentioned: eight 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 ask Leo eight 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 two seven five five three six eight 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 two seven five five three six. That's toll free in the U.S. Outside the U.S., you can uh, just call that with the Skype or some other, uh, you know, VoIP to phone system, and that'll that'll work just great. It won't cost you a penny. And I say outside the U.S. because we have a lot of listeners on the internet. You can find that at twit.tv if you want to subscribe to the podcasts or even listen live. You can do that all over the world at twit.tv. Uh, the website for the Tech Guy show is techguylabs.com, and that's where you'll find not only the phone number, but also a link to the chat room. So you can join us uh, in chat, which we love. There's a, a chat going on uh, pretty much 24-7 at that site, even when I'm not on. They're, <laughs> they're, they're there all the time. Chat, 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 chat. Well, let's see. What happened in the world this week of tech news? Tim Cook gave a, a number of interviews. Tim Cook's the CEO of Apple. You'd be forgiven for not knowing his name. Anybody not Steve Jobs is a little less memorable. But uh, he's he's been uh, they, Apple's been chopping him around to the... Uh, he did an interview with uh, Brian Williams on the, his show, The Rock. He did an interview with Business Week, I think some others. Uh, interesting. When you see something like that going on, you got to wonder, all right, why all of a sudden, right? What is Apple? Because clearly this doesn't come out of nowhere. This is Apple going to all these people saying, would you like a, an interview with, with our CEO? Ah, hmm. So what is, why? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, according to Forbes, Apple's quarterly results, which are going to come out next week, uh, are not going to be so good. They'll, In fact, Apple profit's going to fall for the first time in nine years. Mm, according to now, this is not according to Apple. This is according to people watching this closely. Now, these are predictions. Apple's often historically done better than the uh, the predictions, but we shall see. Maybe that's it. Uh, they they don't have a whole lot of product announcements. They uh, in in September and October they announced all the new products that the everything was updated. Everything first time in history. So it's not that. He did drop a hint, though, with uh, Brian Williams that uh, Apple would be doing a TV next year. Hmm. Also bringing ma some manufacture home to the U.S. Very good. It might be, uh, as Arbiter says in our chat room, have something to do with the fact that Apple's stock is down over 20% in the last two months. They're, fight they're fighting a battle, a rear guard action. Hmm. Could be that. You know, you always wonder when you get the CEO out on a tour like that. It doesn't happen very often, especially from Apple, that there's something up. Something up. T-Mobile uh, shocked everybody. The uh, The CEO of T-Mobile announced that they're going to change how they uh, do cell phone business. And I think this will be very interesting to watch. T-Mobile's 
CEO, John Legere, said that we, we're going to get the iPhone next year. That'll mean all four of the big cell phone companies, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and now T-Mobile will have the iPhone. But they're going to do it in a different way. They're eliminating that this is going to be very interesting to watch this. They're eliminating the device subsidies. So you know when you buy a cell phone, it's it's free or cheap, right? Relatively. 200 bucks for an iPhone, but the actual cost of an iPhone is six or seven hundred bucks. Because the phone company just underwrites the rest of the amount of money. It's paying that to Apple and and uh, and they know they're gonna make it up in fees over the two year contract. That's why they have a two year contract and why you have to pay if you cancel an early termination fee. T Mobile says we're gonna get rid of early termination fees. We're gonna get rid of contracts. We're gonna stop subsidizing the phone. We'll sell them unlocked at six hundred fifty to eight hundred fifty bucks, depending on the model. And now they are gonna find they're offer financing. They 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 said that uh, they implied that they could uh, charge ninety nine bucks for the advice to the phone and then charge you fifteen or twenty dollars in payments over twenty months. Which kind of, I'm not sure exactly how that's different from a subsidized contract. I think that's them hedging their butts because do you think you know people are very conscious. That's interesting. People are very aware that when they call me of the cost of the phone up front, like that's important, and and they totally ignore the fact that they're going to spend a few thousand, maybe two or. Th- Twenty-two or three thousand dollars over the two-year life of the phone, so that two hundred bucks, big deal, big deal. You know, from a purely financial point of view. And T-Mobile says, over the two years or or so that you have this phone, you're going to save a lot of money because our plans are going to be a lot cheaper. But you'll still have that out-of-pocket upfront cost. This will be interesting to watch. I, I, for a long time, I've been saying, let's get rid of the early termination fees. Let's get rid of contracts. Let's t- let's treat cell phones the same way we treat any other business. You do business with them until you don't. The more flexible you are, the easier you can move around. The, the more pressure there is on cell phone companies to do the right thing. But on the other hand, I, will consumers get it? I don't know. And then the funniest story of the week it just cracks me up is about Netflix. Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, posted on his Facebook page that Netflix had streamed one billion hours in June for the first time ever. He put a little status update. He's he's gonna get, he's in trouble with the SEC. They may even prosecute him over that. The SEC says, no, that's that's material information stockholders need to know about. See, their job is to protect, uh, to protect people against insider trading. So if a, there's a material statement about a publicly held company, it needs to be done in a public way so that all the stock... Facebook, you heard of that? They said, no, no, you should have done a press release. Fa- what? He has 200,000 subscribers on Facebook. That sounds public to me. The SEC says Facebook is not the same as a press release. I, I respect, I, I totally respect their need to, uh, to to level the playing field so that people don't have insider information and uh, make money on stocks because they know something we don't. But this is quite the opposite. This is letting real people know. And and Hastings says, and by the way, we said that was going to happen. We said we're coming up on that in our official filings. SEC staff says they're recommending a civil action against Reed Hastings. For violating Reg FD, the rule designed to ensure individual investors have equal access to information as large institutional investors. First of all, <laughs> if you're an institutional investor and you're not following Reed Hastings on Facebook, you probably should. <laughs> He's, and Reed says, hey, we think posting to 200,000 people is very public, especially because many of my subscribers are reporters and bloggers. And, of course, that, that's, that story went out like crazy in, back in July when it happened. Second, we think my public post on Facebook is public. <laughs> this is an example of uh, of uh, the real world not keeping up with the uh, the world of tech, or maybe the tech world is the real world and the SEC is not. I don't know. I thought that was just uh, fascinating. Well, we could talk about that. We could talk about the fact that, speaking of the real world not keeping up with the tech world. There's a company called Uber. Have you ever ever heard of Uber? This is actually a great company. You get a little iPhone app, and it's only in some cities. I've used it in uh, San Francisco, Paris. It's in L.A. It's in quite a f- 25 cities, uh, I think, something like that. And you use an iPhone app, press a button, a car comes and gets you. Hey, it's cool. 
They're being shut down in Toronto because uh, they're, <laughs> they violated municipal licensing rules uh, because I guess, well, you know, it, it, they've had trouble in Washington, D.C., in New York, in Vancouver, in Toronto, mostly because taxi cabs want a monopoly on all this. They don't like this idea. They don't like this idea. I like it. It's good for consumers. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, hey, let's face it. We're all trying to say uh, we need more laws. Protect us against the evil taxi cab companies. Or the evil Uber. I prefer LastPass strongly. I, uh, I one pass is good, one password is good, but LastPass is better, particularly because uh, of stuff that you don't see. The fact that they don't have access to your password database, things like that. Yeah, I saw G4 is becoming the Esquire channel. They're doing a deal with Esquire. Which website is that, Edgevind? Twit.tv or Tech Guy Labs. Call 866 the number 2 get net. 866 2 G E T N E T. Let me go look. High speed internet for $14.95 a month. Call 866 the number 2 get net to get. Folks, have you heard about ESET? Cybersecurity for the Mac? Yes, yeah. That world famous lightweight computer protection I've been talking about. Yeah, he said that they were going to go month to month and no ETF. They were going to be the GQ channel. They were negotiating with GQ which is a Condé Nast magazine, uh, and they ended up doing a deal with Hearst which, for uh, Esquire. <laughs> Basically, how long before you have women jumping on trampolines? That's my question. need that. Plus, ESET understands that Scantily clad women jumping on trampolines. And ESET's cybersecurity for the Mac introduces a unique complementary... Well, it said they would do gaming TM204, which is interesting. I'm talking to the chat room for those who are wondering why. Who, who is Leo talking to? I'm not feuding with Kevin Pereira. He was. We had him on Twitter, remember? I've never feuded with Kevin Pereira. That's a mis mischaracterization. Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, exactly. Hearst is in the TV business. Nobody in, who reads Esquire wants to see skimpily clad men playing volleyball, Dr. Mom. You're thinking of the Oprah channel. Or something like that. Uh, we do have a Twit community on uh, Good News on Google+. It's called This Is Twit. Join it. I'll show you. Since I log in. We also have a Tech Guy community, which I should mention. Communities... Communities. So there's Team Tech Guy, only 31 members. That's one. And then this is Twit is the official community. There are other communities like the Twit Army and so forth, but this is the official community. I think communities are really exciting. They are not supported by the phone app, no. Boy, they think a lot of your posts are spam. They're really being aggressive about uh, fighting spam. Huh. Oh, yeah, I gotta add a moderator. Maybe Theater Monkey. I like communities. I think it's the best thing Google Plus has done in a while. Um, invite people, share community, edit community. Thank you, sir. I wonder how I add a moderator. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
8888-ASK-LEO. That's the number if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion. We have uh, embraced, we'll see if it's uh, if it's embraceable, but we've embraced the Google Plus communities. Something new Google added uh, Thursday, I think, uh, on Google Plus, which is their, their little used but very nicely designed social network. Um, they now have communities, which are kind of like the old Google groups or Yahoo groups. And there is a Team Tech Guy group, the official group. So if you want to stop by and say hi at the Team Tech Guy, we'll figure out a way to use it. <laughs> so I, don't, I haven't thought about that yet. We also have a great chat room. That's the active community right now. A thousand people in there. If you want to join us, just go to the website, techguylabs.com. Richard in West L.A., our first caller of the day. Hi, Richard. Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, thanks for taking the call. Um, I have been using Yahoo Mail for years, and in the left frame toward the bottom, there's a list of various places you can go, including calendar. And, in fact, I uh, put in dates and things that I want to uh, make sure I'm reminded of because it's connected to Yahoo Mail, and I get alert, an alert. However, calendar no longer exists in that left frame, among other things, and I'm wondering if you know anything about why they pulled it. I'll have to call Marissa Meyer and ask her. I have no idea. Um, so what's going on with Yahoo is that this company's been just struggling like crazy. They have all these great properties, including, I think, Yahoo Mail, which has a lot of potential, although it's been a haven for spammers of late. Uh, they have uh, Flickr. Uh, they have a lot of content sites like uh, OMG, uh, TV.com. They're really, they're really an amazing property that has just, you know, it's like, uh, like that house down the street where they haven't painted it and letting the grass get overgrown. Uh, and they've gone through a series of CEOs. I can't remember if it was five or six in the last 10 years. It was just crazy. So finally, they hired just a few months ago Marissa Meyer from Google. She was one of the original Google engineers, one of the people who ran Google. She was in charge of search at Google for a long time. And uh, the hope is that Marissa can turn Yahoo around. But one of the first things she's doing is, is uh, apparently is killing some stuff. Um, now, I don't know why. I think the calendar is still around. In fact, a number of people in the chat room say that the calendar is still there. So I'm not sure why you don't see it. Is it I have two computers, uh, Leo, a portable and a desktop. Disappeared on both of them. I wonder if you disabled that in your settings or... It's I a... didn't touch anything. I turned it on one morning to, to plug in a uh, an appointment that I had and calendar didn't exist. Um, so uh, let me go back, though. You suggested something. There, there is this, I think there is a settings at the top of the uh, uh, page there on the Yahoo Mail. Yeah, you might, you might check to see if, uh, you know, it's, uh, oh, you know, one of the things they did is, and maybe you did this, uh, clicked a button that went to the new so-called Yahoo Mail. It's now in an application in Yahoo Mail. So, okay, so it isn't in the, okay, I'm, I'm looking at the chat room. I don't, I have Yahoo Mail, but I'm not currently logged into it. Uh, I All use right. I use Google Mail. The calendar link is not in the left bottom corner. It you have to re-add the tab. Click the applications link, and it's one of the applications now. Ah, terrific. Okay, I thought I tried that, but apparently I didn't. Thank you very much. Sure, Richard. It is though. I mean, you expect big changes, and one of the things that Marissa has said, my good friend Marissa. That's what I call her by her first name. One of the things Marissa has said, no, Ms. Meyer has said, is that Yahoo. She wants to revitalize Yahoo Mail. Uh, that's a that's a heck of a property that's just been kind of let, you know, degrade. Uh, it, as I said, a lot of spammers now use Yahoo addresses. Really great opportunity for her. Gmail, which she knows a lot about, has done very well for Google. And I think a lot of the people who used to use Yahoo Mail have moved to Gmail. Um, if If she can take Yahoo Mail and make it as functional as Gmail, I think there's an opportunity. Uh, AT&T uh, uses uh, Yahoo for their uh, back end for email if you're an AT&T uh, user for the internet. So they have a lot of customers. In fact, I think it's arguably, it might be bigger than Gmail. It certainly was for a long time. Mark in Boston makes a really good point. They've got to secure it better. And it's true that uh, for a while, Yahoo Mail accounts were the most hacked accounts. I'm not sure why that was. But I, you know, I would get a lot. And then there was a there was a scam going around where somebody would get into your Yahoo Mail account, read up a little bit on you, and then st send out mail to everybody in your address book on Yahoo Mail, saying that they had uh, gone to Europe and been mugged, and they'd lost their passport and all their money. And could you please wire them some money 
and they'd pay you the minute they got back, and it would come from somebody you knew with some details that were personal. It happened to me. It happened to a lot. Of, I mean, didn't, I wasn't hacked. A friend of mine was, and I got that email. Uh, I don't know if that's still happening. So I expect some big changes over the next uh, year for Yahoo. I think applications will go away. Some applications like Flickr, which is one of Yahoo's best properties, will, will be less neglected. And I hope Yahoo Mail will be. And if not, then Yahoo's in deep trouble. They've got to turn this thing around. It's hard to believe. This is one of the early you know, winners on the Internet. And uh, it's hard to believe that they've stumbled so badly. And it just shows you that you can lose your, lose your way very easily in this uh, in this internet of ours 8888 ask leo thanks for the call richard chris in charlotte north carolina you're next hi chris hey leo thanks for taking my call my pleasure um got a question i've spent hours looking on this uh googling this and haven't found an answer so hopefully you can you can help me out here um my father who uh keeps getting a text message um, from Facebook. It's a legitimate message. I've Googled it. It's the message you get when you've turned on uh, text message verification if somebody, or if you've logged into a, an unauthorized computer. Right. Um, the, problem, yeah, the problem is he does not have a Facebook account. Um, and the only thing I can figure out is somebody has, you know, fat fingered their phone number for that option, but put his in. Um, now he has has, well, it's uh, probably it's phone. a sign of somebody probably trying to hack his Gmail account, right? Well, he doesn't have. He doesn't I mean, have his face, Facebook. He doesn't have an email account. It's, he doesn't have a Facebook account. <laughs> oh, so he's getting a text message from Facebook, but he doesn't have a face, Facebook account. Exactly, and <laughs> and the worst part, I mean, uh, it, other than being aggravating, he doesn't have a text message plan, so he's running up, you know, seven eight bucks. Oh a month man, on, on these messages, and we can't figure out how to turn it off. And so somebody somebody before. thinks that their number is... This would be my guess. Somebody thinks that their number is his number and keeps trying yeah, to right. add that cell number to their Facebook account. So what Facebook does is it sends a text saying... Or they have already done so. Sends a text saying, hey, you know, you've got to send this confirmation. Is he getting... What is he getting? Is he getting the conf, the, the confirmation that this is your mail? Your, you know, or, you know, what does it say? What does the message say exactly? It, it says um, a, a new device is logged into your Facebook oh, account today at whatever. It, it, if it wasn't authorized, check your email for instructions. Well, <laughs> it's, it's obviously wow. going to some other email. Wow. That's really so, interesting. I, I so he has no Facebook account. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and, wow. All right, let me think about this, Chris. We have to take a break. Let me think. I have to use my put my thinking cap on, consult with my brains in the chat room, see if we can figure this out. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Yeah. Were you getting echo on that? Oh, yeah, lots of echo. Why do you think that is? Hey, Leo. Yeah. Okay. Will you do me a huge favor? Uh, uh -oh. Since we're in a since we're in a local, one of the things that they did say was that if I reset the call, and I just wanted to run that by with you, so like put it on hold and then and then pop it right back on if, it, if there is an echo, that that might recalibrate it. We still have Bill on hold. Can we put him on real quick through this local? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or Chris. I'm yeah, sorry, Chris. Just tell me. Just tell me whatever you want to do. Anything you want to do. See if it has an echo. That's All what right. I want to see right All here. Right. All right. Hey, Chris. Are you there? Oh, you're not going to pick him. He's on one. Oh, I have to pick him up. Oh, I have to pick him up. Yeah, I'll get it. I got it. Don't press it. I got Honestly, it. Hi. I got it. I got it. Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, uh. Uh, I'm here. Hi, Chris. So I'm going to try to yeah. talk and see if there's echo. We're trying to solve this echo problem. There is echo. There's, okay. It's lower level, uh, uh, Kyle, but I hear it. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Thanks, Chris. Hold on. I'm gonna. This is a. This is a great question, Chris. I can't wait to figure out what's going on here. This is fascinating. Fascinating. All right. So some. So you wouldn't be getting that message unless you had associated a cell phone number. Oh, it must be a previous holder of that account, right? Because you cannot validate a cell phone on Facebook. 
unless you've associated that cell phone with the account. And in order to associate it, you actually have to have the cell phone send an F to Facebook, to F book, and then it would send you and then say, oh, yeah, okay, we validated. So he must, so either he's got somebody else's account, like from a year ago or whatever. I don't think he needs to change the telephone number. What he really wants to do, I think, is create a Facebook account and associate that number with a Facebook account. You can't. I don't think Mark and Boston. You can do that by accident because I think this would only work if you uh, if you authorize that account, right? So he must have. They must have had that. Phone at some point. Yeah, that's a good one. What is your app? Why is Google? Oh God, Google's two step is now. Starting over. Oh yeah, I hate you, Google. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I can't use my Google. I was trying to log into my Yahoo mail from the last call. Still. <sighs> Alright, there's Yahoo. Mail. Right, no calendar. Oh, but calendar is under applications. Yes, it is. <laughs> That was pretty easy. If I had been able to log in, I would have seen that. <laughs> it's like obvious. This is the new Yahoo Mail. So you have to hit that. And there it is. Calendar. Yeah, I, so, I, so here's one possibility. His dad has a relatively new number, a number that was at one time associated with somebody else's Facebook account. It keeps texting him. So what he could do, couldn't he, is uh, create a dummy account on Facebook. Chris should just do this for his dad. Create a dummy account on Facebook, associate it with dad's phone number, never use it, but now he won't get that anymore. Or you think it's some sort of hack attempt? I don't think so. He could also call the phone company and say block all text messages, but I bet you that he wants those text messages. Now, this is interesting. Could not connect to the server calendar at yahoo.com. <laughs> Yahoo is so broken. I'm Leo Laporte, the uh, tech guy. I've been talking to Chris in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Very interesting problem. His dad does not have Facebook. His dad has a phone that is getting text messages periodically saying, you've turned on, uh, and this is, by the way, a good thing to do. I've told everybody to do this on Facebook. Uh, you're trying to use Facebook from a computer we've not seen before. You've turned on authentication. So please use this for your, for whatever it is, five-digit number to confirm that this is you. Which meaningless to your dad because he, he doesn't have a Facebook account. It's not him. It's also probably right. fairly frustrating to the person who's trying to use their Facebook account. They never get this text. And exactly. finally, it's costing dad money because he doesn't have a text plan. So all of this yeah, is... Is frustrating. I did tell Verizon just you know for a short term solution of trying to block that, but they can't. They can only block a phone number, and this message that comes is you know this five digit code. They can't block that. They can only block a ten. Oh phone yeah, number. it's F B O O K. It's coming from F B O. So you can. I think you can respond to this text with stop or off, and it will stop doing it. And, yeah, we have, and we get an, an, an immediate response saying, okay, that it stopped. Um, but it doesn't. Then we'll, we'll, we'll continue. <laughs> so I guarantee you, there's somebody on the other end who's extraordinarily frustrated because they can't get this to work. <laughs> Did your dad recently get this phone number? Uh, it's been about a year now. This okay. has been going on for about six months. Yeah, and so I've been doing research. I need to call you. I so what happened is probably, I mean, it's my guess, my best guess is that a year ago, somebody had Facebook. And they and they uh, and they set up this phone number with Facebook, and uh, and now they're very frustrated <laughs> because they can't get into any they can't get into Facebook on any computers anymore. They keep and uh, they keep re-enabling it. You can't enter the number wrong, in my opinion, because Facebook actually validates the number. The way you associate a text, a SMS, or a cell phone with Facebook is you actually text them from that phone. So it's got to, it, it, it could be a scam or something weird, but. It seems to me, if unless Facebook is broken, which wouldn't be impossible, but it seems to me that the person who had this number before your dad must have associated this number with their Facebook account at some point. 
Yeah. So it was validated. Now, uh, and they're still active because every time they use a new computer, Facebook says, okay, you logged in with your password, but you need to give us this code or, or you can't use the computer. And they're not getting the code and it's driving them nuts. Now, they should have noticed that they have the wrong phone number on there. But they haven't. That's what I kept hoping was going to happen eventually. <laughs> but, you know what you might do? I don't know if this would work or not, but you might create a dummy Facebook account for Dad and associate the phone number with it. Is Facebook smart enough to say, oh, oh, and disable the old one? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, the, the, the last resort, I guess he's going to try to change his phone number. <laughs> no, yeah, that is the very last resort. Let's not do that. Uh, the other thing that uh, the chat room says is you can call Verizon and say, I want to disable short codes. F-B-O-O-K is what they call a short code. It's not a real phone number. Okay. And you could say, I don't want to receive any incoming text from short codes. Short codes, okay. I'll use that terminology to see if they yeah. can understand that. Yeah. Well, um, that That's the other possibility. Well, I will try that, that Facebook trick and see if I can... <laughs> see if that works. Maybe Facebook will it, say, oh, oh, yeah, we have that phone number, but we're going to associate it with you now instead. And then it just it's just a dummy account. It could actually be your account. You Well, you know what you could do is... Do you have a Facebook account? I do. Associate his number with your Facebook account. You don't even have to create an account. Yep. And then uh, just don't use that as your primary. Facebook's a little funky. I can't... I have a, a new Sprint phone that I've been trying to get on Facebook, and I text... Maybe I'm doing this to... Maybe somebody else is now upset, because I keep texting, texting F to Facebook all the time, and I never get a message back. Maybe it's being sent to somebody else now. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, so maybe it's very possible, Chris, that Facebook's funky. If you think what Facebook is doing, it's kind of mind boggling. They've got a billion, one billion with a B users and they have to keep track of all of this information. So it could very well be there's something going, you know, broken in Facebook, but how long has it been going on months? Yeah, I, I think it's, I think your, your conclusion that it probably was somebody's valid number when right. they initially set it up. Yeah. And that person's I've being tried- very frustrated. Yeah, and it's because it sends you an email saying, Are you, is this, did you do this correctly? Or not an email, but mm-hmm. a text. And so, and then the number was changed, maybe, and exactly. my dad stuck with it. Exactly. And by the way, this is whoever whoever uh, did this not only is frustrated but is doing the right thing. And I, maybe I'll use this as an, a, a chance to mention this. You, this is a feature you should turn on in Facebook. Facebook's been making themselves more secure. For instance, Facebook now does secure HTTP at all times, which is good because by not doing that, they were uh, opening themselves to an attack that would allow somebody to access your Facebook account if you were on the same open access point. So. You wanted to use HTTPS, that's secure HTTP with Facebook. You can turn that on in the settings, and I think Facebook has just turned that on globally. The other thing you might want to turn on if you want to secure your Facebook, go to your Facebook settings, go to security settings, and you'll see there is something called login approvals. That's what's going on here, by the way. This is the login approvals. What that means is it says approvals required when logging in from an unrecognized device. So let's say somebody got your Facebook password. Some bad guy got your password somehow, looked over your shoulder, then tried to log in from his computer. Facebook would say, yeah, you got the password, but uh, I'm going to send you a five-digit number, and you need to enter that next. And unless they have your phone as well, they won't be able to use that. So that's a good thing to turn on, login approvals. It's not well-named, but uh, it's an fact, you know, everybody should do this right now. <laughs> Go through your security settings at Facebook and really think about it. Look at recognized devices, for instance. Um, look at active sessions. Make sure that those are local. Um, all of this stuff is very useful. And, and, of course, the most important, turn on secure browsing. I think it's enabled by default now. You should you should absolutely look into all of this if you're using Facebook. This is important stuff. You don't want somebody to compromise your Facebook account. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> that would not be good. I should I should uh, you know I've done this for teenagers. Give classes on uh, and locking down their Facebook, and uh, and it's certainly a worthwhile thing to do. I don't know if there's any source for that. Facebook's own information. They're trying to get it better, but it's still kind of hard to understand. And they keep changing it. There's hundreds of settings. John Decatur, Illinois, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, John. 
Hey, how you doing? I'm well. Santa and his elves are trying to figure out how to do something. I need your advice. I am always willing to help Santa and or elves. <laughs> um, to change a computer to a server, is that a hardware issue, a software issue, both? Well, uh, tell me a little bit more about what, you, what you're trying to do. I mean, a, a server is a computer. There's no... Nothing. There's nothing magic about a server. All okay. all servers are computers, are basic computers. It's the software they're running that makes them a server. What do you want to serve? Okay. Uh, like uh, gaming. Ah, you want to set up. Uh, so what game? Uh, American Army. So you want to have you want to run an American Army server, game server. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Um, and you want to run this for people inside your house or globally? Globally. Okay. So the, the trick is, and I don't know American Army, but in general the trick is if you want to run a game server from your home, you need to open up ports on your firewall uh, or your router to let incoming traffic connect to you. So we're going to take a break, and I'll explain what that meant in <laughs> just a little bit. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And yeah, now I'm worried. I see 40 recognized devices. Mostly that's phones, right? I should just uh, just unrecognize all of these. Oh, you know, so some things like Aperture on my MacBook needs is a is considered a separate device, right? Facebook app. I should probably remove a lot of these. <laughs> I should definitely. Remove. So every time I log in a new device, I add Facebook to it, right? They should have a global. Just get them all off. I'm just gonna remove them all. So that means now that I will get that text message the next time I log into any of these devices. This is not a bad thing to do once in a while. Just prune. You should go to Twitter, prune, uh, prune out applications, go to Facebook, prune. I'll show you that one. That's a good one. On Facebook, you know, every time you install an application on Facebook, you're giving it permissions. And you may have installed applications ages ago and forgotten. I know I have. So periodically I go to the applications page. So now I've let's undo all of those. Now every, next time I log in, no, I don't want to deactivate my account. All right, let's uh, let's go back and look at apps. Account settings, apps. So these are apps that I've authorized, and it's probable that you've authorized apps and forgotten about them. Particularly go down to the bottom of the page. That's the oldest stuff that you've authorized. Oh, boy. That may take a while. <laughs> There's a lot. Okay. Uh, learn this. Yeah, that's right. Z no, see, these are all all right. Cobook, NFL, backup of five, bottlenose. Yeah, these are all right. But you might want to look at these and say, God, you know, I haven't used that in six months, right? I probably should delete Stilla. So visit go to my PC.com, click the try it free button, enter the promo code Leo. And then you can even delete all the activity on there. So look at stuff you haven't used in a while. That's probably a good. This is all really valuable. Everybody has my Facebook permissions because I use Facebook as a public thing, not as a, uh, not as a, you know, a private thing. Logged in from San Rafael. That worries me a little bit. It says I'm logged in from San Rafael. No, oh, it's approximate. So these are good, too. These are the recent logins. Probably good to check these. This is nice that Facebook does all this. They're giving you so much information now. Elk Grove. I don't believe I was in Elk Grove. Let's, let's end that activity. Sun Valley. Let's end that activity. So what that does is that deletes the cookie or makes the cookie un, uh, unusable. Can you? Ah, oh, look at that. Location estimated based on IP address. That's cool. That's nice. Yeah, I didn't know that. They've done a nice job, I think. This is a, these these are all big improvements, and the problem is it's you know so deep. Let me 
check this in ages. Twitter is not connected. That's odd. Huh. Oh, let's not show my phone numbers. It's all very interesting. And for some reason, I cannot activate this Sprint phone. It just won't let me. I do not understand why. So I have to keep keep these other phones active. Yeah, because cell phones, you know, it's towers and stuff. The Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo. John's next. Oh, no, I talked to John. Oh, we're still talking to John. So he wants to run a game uh, server, uh, and he wants to run it out of his house. Um, now, I'm looking. Uh, somebody just sent me the uh, America Army game server and hosting. Actually, that's third-party hosting, but he doesn't want to do third-party hosting. He wants to do it from his own home. Do you have to have Linux? That's the question. Uh, no. No, all right. So they have win- They will let you serve it from Windows. They do Windows, Linux, and... All right. So you'll be running that sof- software on there, um, and you'll need so that's to... All, that's the only difference is software. Yeah. It's not a hardware. No. You just have to run the game server on there. But again, you may have to open up a port on your firewall or your router. Yeah. Yeah, there's a help there that tells me there's two ports I need to open up. The following ports must be open. Actually, it's more than that. There's UDP and TCP ports. Yeah, they're UDP. Yeah, so 17, 16, 17, 18, 87, 76. There's there's quite a few ports. Do you know how to open ports on your firewall? I got a help on it on, yeah. the, on the internet. So it'll be in your your router is your firewall. So you'll be going into your router configuration via the web. You know, you open up your router 192. I have to open ports and then forward it to That's my right. router. That's right. So here's what happens. Uh, you go into the router and you'll say, all right, whenever traffic comes in from these ports, and there's a port is really kind of imaginary. You could think of it as a special connection. You know, like a patch bay, the old days of the switchboards and Hello, one ringy dingy, and they connect. You can think of it that way. It's like a patch cord. And what you're telling right. the what you're telling the router is, all right. If somebody well, rings on one of these ports, I want you to direct it to the game server. And and so that's the most secure way to do it. There's other ways to do it. For instance, you could do something called DMZing the game server, which means just put it out on the internet publicly. Don't recommend that. But you could. Don't often people. Yeah, often people do that because it's too complicated to do port forwarding. But it's not as safe because that means anything can hit your hit your computer. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you one question? Sure. When you open these ports, does that uh, invite trouble for your computer? Well, no, and somebody- that's that's why you want to open specific ports as opposed to opening all ports. A DM putting a putting a computer in the DMZ means. Any incoming traffic, that computer can see. That means it's vulnerable because, you know, hackers and so forth will try all sorts of things to get into that system. If you keep it well secured, it's probably all right. But if you say specifically, I only want to see traffic from 17, 16, 17, 18, and so forth, only traffic coming in on those ports will be allowed through, so your router is still doing its job. You know, think of the router as a brick wall that you've opened up a couple of gaps in, and it will only be going to that machine where incoming traffic like that, it, the machine will say, ah, yes, that goes to the uh, America's Army server. Let it handle it. Now, if there's a bug in the American Army server, yes, absolutely, somebody could exploit that because they're talking directly to that server. But only if there's a bug. So if you change your computer, Mike, I've got a desktop, to a server, all I'm doing is just putting a software disk right. in there. Yeah, you're running a program. Flip-flop back and forth. You could turn it off. You you bet. If that's okay, if the America's Army server is not running, nothing will happen. Now those ports will still be open, uh, but that's an easy thing to do. Go back once you've once you've done port forwarding once, you know you can turn it off and on. Talk, turn it off and on. It's not so not so very good. Thank you. You're welcome, John. It's a great it's a great uh, thing to know about. In ge- you always have some ports open on your on your router, or you wouldn't be able to get to the internet. Port eighty. For instance, is always open. That's the port that lets you surf the web. That's always open. Uh, outgoing email uses port 25. That has to be open or email won't go out. 
So there's always little gaps in that firewall. There have to be. If a firewall is 100%, then that means you're not on the Internet. And what you want, what you hope, is that the, the, the programs that are accepting traffic over those ports, your email program or your web browser, don't have bugs. It's interesting, isn't it, that most of the attacks on our computers these days come through what? The web browser. Because that's port 80. It's always open. It's always available. So bad guys, what do they do? They try to find an exploit that can come in through the browser. That's where almost all viruses come in. If you have a well, if, you know, properly configured router, and most of them are properly configured out of the box, they, that is a very effective firewall. Other attacks won't come through. So it's, a, it's yeah, running a, ser a server is nothing special. In fact, when you go to a website, it's somewhere in a big room somewhere, a network center somewhere, there's a computer that's probably very much like your desktop computer running an Intel chip, hard drives, memory. It most likely isn't running Windows. It could be. Windows has server software. But more likely it's running Apache which is a, and Linux, which is an open source operating system. Most servers run that. Apache is the web server software. And it's, it's just a program running on a Linux computer. That's all it is. Phil, are you regretting the uh, idea of throwing this giant New Year's Eve party at this point? Hello. Hey, Phil Hello. in Roseville, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you having regrets? Um, not well. <laughs> <laughs> there is a famous incident where a young girl uh, advertised her birthday party on Facebook, and over a thousand people showed up. Hmm. It's a little risky. Where have you advertised this birthday party? Well, uh, website and uh, just starting Facebook flyers. Uh, Radio is being considered. Oh, you want a big party? Yeah. <laughs> so hundreds of police confronted rioters in a small Dutch town where a 16-year-old's birthday party invitation on Facebook spawned a large gathering that turned destructive, authorities said Saturday. This was uh, in September. Video of the incident showed rioters hurling glass bottles. This is a 16-year-old birthday. Bottles and other debris oh. at security teams. 34 people arrested after rioters torched at least two cars, threw stones, and a smashed storefront windows. So, <laughs> just a word of warning. <laughs> Do not put yes. your birthday party invitation this. on Facebook. <laughs> I've been doing this for many years, and no okay. issues. You're, you're safe. Roseville is a nice town. People are nice up there. It's safe. Yeah. So you're advertising not, it. But what, is your, what are you worried about? It's, I'm not in, it's not in Roseville. It's just where I live. Ah, okay. I'm wanting to know is um, how I can tr find out what's working because I'm doing all these ah, things. Ad tracking, and yeah. My son who's into advertising tells me you have to find out what works. Yeah, so you or you're wasting your money. We do that. Notice I just did a Carbonite ad. What did I do in the Carbonite ad? I said, if you want to sign up, use my name, Leo. That's what they use for tracking. So uh, Carbonite, who's been with me for five years has lots of ads. They do ads on other radio shows, on TV, and so forth. When they do it on Rush Limbaugh, it says, use my, use my offer code Rush, or whatever he uses. And, uh, and uh, so then in their database, when you sign up on the web, they count how many Leos and how many Rushes and how many other things. And by the way, the reason they've been here five years is because Leo works, right? Mm, maybe so. I should advertise on you. <laughs> no, <laughs> not unless you want mayhem. Because uh, I have rowdy listeners. So, yes, you absolutely should track. So probably the best way is when you have sent, uh, you must send people somewhere to buy a ticket or to, or to register. Make sure you ask them, where did you hear it? And keep track. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Can you believe this? This is not the first time this has happened. She's still in hiding, apparently. I love the holidays. I really do, but the Leo. last thing Ma the yes. holidays is go to the post office. Everybody's there. Is okay. Best story, and you probably it's know this, but about you and live and reads, is, it, yeah. is when I first started business. working here two years ago, time. Trevor <laughs> Trevor made me pull a live read from you, and he Stand said, I need it to send, a, to send a rush, to show Rush a good Listen, you people, this is how you do it. This is, listen to Leo. This is how you do it, I wasn't going to say that. Take your address book from 
QuickBooks, from your computer. If Rush. You're Amazon, eBay, Etsy. But I do. PayPal, I, I talk to uh, the folks at Carbonite. In fact, I talk to all, most of our advertisers uh, every year or so just to say hi. And uh, universally, they say we don't get we get the best results. Stamps.com. You got from your show of anything we do. offer for you. It's worth Thank God. Including a digital That's why the uh, the network, the podcast the network, made $6 million this year. Before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the page and type Most of them on uh, ads that I do. Stamps.com. Use my name Which layout. makes me wonder, where the hell's my money? I, sh- I should be rich. <laughs> well, I'll, t- I'll tell you where that. You see this? You see this studio out here? That's where my money went. That's that's where it went. You're tuned among other things. Channel 7. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I, six minutes past the hour. Something like six million. I just saw the numbers for the first three quarters. It was 4.75. So presuming that uh, the fourth quarter, which is usually our biggest quarter, does... Uh, yeah, I spent it on SkyMall. It's all going to SkyMall. Uh... <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, when you have when you we spend, I don't know what the payroll is. It's a couple hundred thousand a month in payroll. It is our best year. We've had every year has been up considerably. Uh, this year started out to be a bad year. The first quarter, uh, we were remember we had to cancel shows and we spent a hundred thousand dollars. That's where else my money went. Hundred thousand dollars on Game On and. Um, uh, we were we canceled shows and we laid some people off because we uh, we were a little worried because our first quarter was very weak and we thought uh oh so I, I tr- you know I I'm not I don't have investors we're only uh, all all this is bootstraps all, all yes Lorik I would love a uh, a soup yes whatever soup you think looks good today is that what you're asking me yes yes I would love a soup because it's it's winter winter means soup time. I don't want to hear it. I want soup. Thank you, Lark. You pick. You pick. Anything good. No, I don't. I literally don't know what I'm spending on payroll. I don't want to know. I know. Lisa told me once what our power bill was, and I freaked out. Our power bill is like $4,000 a month. Oi, go vault. Oi, go vault. Chad and Schwood and others know what do they talk about, Arbiter? See when the when the cat's away, the mice will play. Actually, Carbonite dumped Rush, didn't they? They did. That's right. I don't know. Did uh, did all of advertisers go back to Rush, or do they uh, once it once the notoriety blew over? We should go solar. I would love to do that. I wanted to make this a self sufficient network. But it's not practical. I know, Superman, but uh, I should. Many have told me you should be signing all the checks. But, you know, it's a pain in the ass, so I finally gave Lisa signing signing rights. I trust her. Only Lisa and I can sign checks. You know, I'm such a not a businessman. I know I'm doing things wrong. But um, um, I just don't have the patience. So what I really decided, what my goal was when I started uh, Twit, was to be able to do the shows and walk away and let everything else be handled. And that's where I've got. But in order to do that, you have to give up some control. You can't, you can't, you know, be micromanaging everything. So... Uh, I found somebody that I really trust, Lisa, who's been a brilliant business person. One of the reasons our sales of she, you know, when I hired her, our sales doubled each year for the first three years. And um, uh, we couldn't keep that up, but uh, I think our sales will be up 20 or 30% this year. Next year should be very good. Next year should be very good. You know, the reason we canceled Twit Photo, that was in that first quarter uh, cancellation uh, rush, is we just we couldn't make any money on it, and I couldn't afford it. was very expensive, and I couldn't afford it. So. No, that's right, Major Tech. Founders make crappy CEOs. I'm the vision guy. I'm the um, product guy. That's my job. 
and uh, and and Lisa lets me uh, do that, and I have to worry about who. But we talk. I mean, we don't. I don't. She doesn't hire anybody without my permission, and um, you know, I'm, I'm in on all. You know, so far it's small enough I can be involved in everything. Yeah, what I decided was like the way to make the most money is for me to make the most shows, not to waste my energy doing stuff that doesn't make money. Yes, I can still fire people. <laughs> You know, a lot of people are good. I would bet that Bob Hope had a good business manager, I would guess. Maybe not. No. Well, it depends how new a newbie, Cooter, but that's an awesome camera. If if you want to spend the money and the, and the person's committed to photography, a T4i is a fantastic camera. I do choose the coffee. <laughs> well, we're talking about owning property. We wanted to buy this building, but the landlord is asking an exorbitant this price. We we keep we talked. He actually came back to us and said, "You sure we well, want to buy it?" But he was asking more than market. So what we would do, for instance, to buy this building, which would probably be several million dollars, is put together a syndicate. And Lisa's done this. She knows how to do this. Put together a syndicate of investors, and. Um, and they would, they would, uh, you know, we would be the managing partner, and they would be participants in the in the proceeds. Um, but we, if you do that, you gotta, you can't, you can't buy it for a lot more than market value, or the investors are going, well, I'm not going to do that. We'll begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. We're waiting, Bill, in Michigan. We've contacted New Tech, and we, uh, I know they're shipping the new TriCaster, the 8500. And, uh, we are on the list, so we're just uh, we're just waiting. Twit today is John C. Dvorak, Jolie O'Dell, and I think Harry McCracken. I'm not sure, and I think they're all in studio. You are tuned to Premier Channel Seven. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin. At Windows Phone Show is moving along. I think we're going to have Premier, our plan Radio. is uh, Iaz, Alex Gumpel, and uh, Shannon Morse. We're going to get snubs to co-host with uh, with. Um, I as. That'll be soon. I miss science on Twit Multivec. I'm, and that is, it's problem, problem is it's, um, I would like to do that. Yes. We've got to find uh, the right show. <laughs> Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, internet, digital photography. Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, our myth, photographic myth buster, will bust another photographic myth at 33 and a third past the hour today. We could also talk about home theater. Anything with a chip in it. This is the place. 8888-ASK-LEO. Running a game server, Facebook text messages, anything. We've had some good calls. That first hour, that was fun. Really interesting conundrums. So give keep let's keep up the good work. Eighty eight eighty eight ask Leo. Eighty eight eighty eight ask Leo. The website is techguylabs.com. We've got James DeRuvo. He's scribbling as I talk. He writes down uh, quick notes of of everything I say, all the links and so forth. Puts them up at techguylabs.com. Uh, then the elves come in. They take the video. They edit it. They create a YouTube video. They upload it to YouTube. Josh Windish then. Redoes the transcription so that after the show's over, a couple of hours, maybe a couple of days, sometimes after the show's over, you can go to techguylabs.com, watch the show, watch individual questions. You say, I want to hear more about that question, that Facebook question. You can go there, you click the link, you can watch the question, watch my answer, listen to my answer if you want. And then, and I hope you will do this, you can comment and say, you know, you could do that actually anytime you do that starting now. You know, I had that happen to me and this is what I did that fixed it. And I would love that. Because we always we always make the site free. The site is free. The podcasts are free. Uh, our great advertisers support it all. I don't ever ask you for money. And I want to make this website, uh, in, with your help, a really great resource, permanent free resource of, of great tech help and information. 
And that would that would be great if you would help me out with that. You'd be part of the team tech guy. The website is techguylabs.com. Tom is in the mountains in San Diego. Hi, Tom. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Hey, Tom. Can you hear me? I'm at uh, 3,800 feet. Wow. How do you breathe at that altitude? Uh, with oxygen. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Obviously, 3,000 isn't uh, the air isn't that thin. But I, I, I get, I get headaches when I get up to five or six thousand feet. It's, uh, but I guess you get used to it, don't you? I'm at the base of Palomar here, so it's not too bad. Not too bad. I remember when I went to Machu Picchu in Peru, well, that's, and that's a, that's I think twenty thousand feet. And when you arrive at the hotel, they give you cocoa leaf tea, coca leaf tea, the stuff they make cocaine out of. The natives drink that, and they say that helps with the altitude sickness. I don't know if it helped with altitude sickness, but I felt pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to import that here as a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they told us because they sell it. Yeah, they sell it in the streets, and I, they said, but probably shouldn't try to get that back into the U.S. with you. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> what can I do for you, Tom? I'm a troglodyte. You're a troglodyte? Yeah, yeah, and I uh, I got an 08 uh, desktop PC, with, and I used to have an IO Magic. I bought a CompUSA uh, burner, CD burner. Yeah. CD only. CD burner. A, yeah. Look at CD rewriter, yeah, all over the world, and uh, I bought one last year at Amazon. It was a SATA connection, and I don't even know what a SATA connection is. I got an IDE a Tappy. Ah. And then I've read, I've read about Windows having XP. I got Home Edition, and yeah. I'm on dial-up. So you're an, you're, you have an older machine with an older IDE connector. So you need an IDE CD burner. Yeah, probably yeah, the best yeah. thing. By the way, do you want you you sure you want it in the case? Because you wouldn't have to worry about that if it were external. Anything that's cheap. <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, that the best thing to do uh, would be to get a USB CD burner. Yeah, question. That's what my question is exactly that. Yeah. I found one at Amazon, and it's a uh, made by some off uh, generic brand. And uh, now. It doesn't say it comes with a, a CD, and I have problems with drivers. It takes forever to download. I'm on dial-up Right, here. right. Some I've had to stop trying You shouldn't to need a driver at all. Okay, should be built into Windows? Yeah. So you won't need a driver to uh, read or write CDs. It will come with some software you might want to install, probably a light version of Roxio CD Creator, and that okay. might have some features that you like. You won't have to. You shouldn't have to download anything. Okay, uh, and you shouldn't, well, by the way, pay more than fifty bucks for this thing. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. I got one for thirteen dollars. I saw, and uh, yeah. it went down from sixteen to thirteen. Yeah, they're, they're. You know, it's funny. I remember buying my first CD burner. Boy, was I excited! I don't yeah. remember what year this was. Probably the ni early nineties, mid nineties. It was uh, twenty five hundred dollars. Holy cow! Yeah, I've seen some expensive stuff, but they're DB. D C D combos is what, what it is. Yeah. It's still thirteen dollars. It went down three dollars from last week. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. when in tech and this is very important lesson to learn. When technology's new, it's expensive. But it very quickly as it ramps up, if it becomes successful, it gets cheaper and cheaper. Now the curve's gonna go the other way soon because physical media is dying. And yeah. uh it'll be harder and harder. Go ahead. How much do you have to pay for a zip drive these days? A lot more than you used to, because Nobody's making them anymore, and people still have, uh, you know, zip disks. <laughs> so, well, everything I, I learn that's new, I get from your show. So good, good man. I got a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> Tom, are you an astronomer? No, no. In fact, I met those guys when we have fires out here, which is uh, the last three we've had over ten years. Yeah, I've met the astronomers down at the evacuation center yeah. in Borrego. It's a great. But, that's uh, a great observatory, Palomar. Retired engineer and just love the mountains. Yeah, I don't blame you. But, uh, this USB now. I've got two USB connections in the front of my desktop and, and a couple in the back. Now, if I use, does that make a difference if I no. use the back or the? Front? Doesn't make it. Doesn't make any difference. With the USB. As long as it's USB. Yep. Great. Should thank be fine. You very much. Hey, thank you for the thank you for the call, Tom. It's great to talk to you. In the mountains of San Diego. That's cool. There are still reasons. In fact, it's not a bad thing to have a USB or a DVD burner. I mean, it's good for backup. It's good for archival storage, things like that. 
Um, but I have a feeling that uh, they're not they're not long for this world. Chuck in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hi, Chuck. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing okay. Uh, I was calling to get your opinion on these iPhone 5S rumors. If you think it's coming out soon, or should I wait to go ahead and get my new iPhone? What's your opinion? You know, it, it, it it's, the iPhone 5 just came out in September. It doesn't take long before the drumbeat starts. Boom, 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 boom. The 5S, boom, 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 boom. Um, I would be shocked. I mean, nobody knows because Apple's not saying, but I would be shocked if Apple did anything but release the next iPhone in a year, in, in September of 2013. They understand that if they come out with this stuff too fast, it makes people nuts. So I would say 5S September. And it is important to note that this is Apple does this TikTok thing where they do a major update every other year. So the 5 was the major update. A 5S would probably be exactly the same with some additional features. All right. Okay. Because I got the four in 2010, then the the S came out. You know, eight months later after I bought mine. So. That was the one time that they broke the cycle because they wanted to move uh, to fall. But I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna be consistently in the fall from now on. Okay. They're absolutely working on it, and that's why you're seeing rumors about it. So you know, somebody may have a picture in China or something. They'll probably start production if they're going to sell it by October. They'll probably start production in uh, June or July. You know, because they need to make. Okay. Nowadays, in order to sell an, you know, if you're going to release an iPhone, you better have 10 million in stock on day one, or you know, you're going to miss out on sales. I read one article where they're actually starting to manufacture some of them now. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, now, one thing to remember is that Apple makes prototypes uh, of of new phones all the time. So the way the design cycle works is they've got a design lab in Cupertino, and they have a 3D printer, and they try all sorts of stuff, and they pick a few. And then they have to, in order, you know, if you again, you got to make ten million. You've got to work closely with your partners in China, the manufacturing partners. So early on, they'll go to Foxconn and say, "This is what we're thinking. What, you know, here's the machines you're going to have to buy or build to make this thing." Then they'll do some production prototypes. That's probably what we're seeing right now is production prototypes. Uh, they won't go into full production probably till a few months before the sales. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, my. Have you been to the post office uh, lately? Oh, it gets so busy this time of the year. It's because, of course, everybody... all the It's amateur hour, right? All the amateurs go to the post office in December to get their stamps for their Christmas card lists. If you're a mailing professional, if you do mailing as part of your business, you don't. the last thing you want to do is uh, waste your time or your employee's time uh, you know, in the post office. You want stamps.com. This is such a... This is a pro tip. This is for... Pro mailers. What stamps.com does it lets you print legal US postage from your computer and your printer. It's not a postage meter. There's no lease. There's no special ink. It's your printer. Your computer works with any computer printer. I got something from stamps.com the other day. Oh, I guess I. Uh, my friend Jessica Corbin is using stamps.com to mail out her Vitness. I see it all the time. You know, you get the special stamps.com mailing labels. You can print right onto uh, envelopes if you're doing invoicing, billing press releases. It'll take the information from your computer. You're not typing anything in. You, it's already in your computer. If you're a, uh, an Amazon seller, an eBay seller, a PayPal seller, Etsy, it will take the information right from the web. those web pages. They've got a USB scale, which is awesome. They took my scale again. I keep, I keep losing it because they, <laughs> they take it in the offices, and we need it. You plop the package on the USB scale. It tells you exactly how much postage you need. prints out the thing. If you're doing international mailing, it'll fill out all the forms for you. So it saves you time. It also saves you money. Now, you, you have to pay a stamps.com monthly. There we go. There's the scale. That's the old scale. They got a shiny new scale, you know, brushed aluminum. So we're going to get the new one. I want the new one. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, you'd pay a monthly subscription fee, but you will make it up. First of all, if you do enough mailing, they waive the fee. But you'll also make it up if in, uh, in discounts. They get discounts at stamps.com. The post office won't give you. Up to 21% on express mail, up to 15% on priority mail. If you're setting express or priority or certified mail, it automatically does the, all the stuff you need to do, including sending an email to the recipient saying, it's on the way, here's the tracking number. I mean, it's it's, profe it's pro. Now, if you go to stamps.com right now, you'll see an $80 uh, no-risk trial. Don't do that. I want you to do the $110 offer. But you've got to go through. i got to make you jump through a hoop for this. 
So in the upper right-hand corner, you see that fancy uh, old-time radio mic? Click that and use the promo code TECHGUY, two words. This is that tracking the guy was talking about. This is how they know that you heard about it on the Tech Guy. And I want and, and in order to encourage you to do that, we've got a better offer. $55 in free postage, $5 supply kit. The digital scale is yours. In fact, it's yours to keep even if you don't stick around. Four-week trial, all of that from Stamps.com. But you have to use Tech Guy to get that improved offer. Stamps.com, click the microphone, use T-E-C-H space guy. And uh, I, I promise you, you're going to really love it. It is the pro way to do mailing. Stamps.com. It's 15% off priority and 10% off express. No, I know. that's It's 21% off express. Maybe it's more off priority. Maybe more off priority. Ba, 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 da. And we do so, we do, just so you know, we do those ads for the podcast. Those are podcast ads, not radio ads. We do radio ads for the, and Premiere gets the money for those. And we do podcast ads because we made a deal with Premiere. When, when the contract ran out, I said, I don't want to raise. They said, what? I said, I want to raise. I just want one thing. I want you to let us sell ads on the podcasts because we had no ads. They said, I said, not only that, I'm going to give you some of that money. So I said, I'm going to give you a raise, Premiere. And they said, we never had a host do that. <laughs> You're telling us you'll renew and pay us money? Yeah. Is breaking, thinking suicide. I ain't got no Okay, not to have an iPhone. Really is. Capsizing, no hope on the horizon. Got a two year contract, and I'm stuck on Verizon. I frankly, but now that's an old song because Verizon now has the iPhone, right? Uh, I frankly prefer the Galaxy Note 2. That's 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 the phone I carry around because it's a it's a honking big phone. I like a five and a half inch screen. The iPhone's only four inches. It's teensy weensy. I need a man sized screen. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number, 888-827-5536. No, P. P. Guild in the chat room said, Leo says not to advertise on the radio show for the New Year's Eve party because we have rowdy listeners. No, I was joking, P. Guild. You're not rowdy. You're, you're calm. Calm and quiet and collected. Mike in Lexington, Kentucky. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. How you doing, Leo? I am well. How are you? Oh, not too bad. I've been a long, long time listener. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Nice to have you. What? I am uh, seriously. I've, I've prefaced this a little bit. I've been. I've had every single iPhone that's ever been out. Me too. And I'm a long, long time Mac user, and I like being in the ecosystem. But I tell you what, when the iPhone five came out, I just couldn't buy it. I'm a little tired of the screen size. No kidding. And, and they didn't really make it bigger. It's 174 pixels taller, same width. So they went from three and a half to four inches. But it's really just one more row of icons. In fact, yeah. all they really did is change from a four by three to a 16 by nine aspect ratio. They stretched it. Yeah. yeah. It's so, not much. I mean, it's I... still tiny. It's a beautiful screen. It's retina. Um, but you're right. I'm with you. In fact, I kept saying Apple's got to do something about this because... The, everybody else's screens are getting bigger and bigger, and people want these. The Galaxy Note sold 10 million units. People want big. That's a bit. I thought that would be a specialty phone with a five-inch screen, and uh, no, people want them. Yeah. Well, I, I, my, my wife thinks the Mayans might be right because I'm actually considering switching from an iPhone uh, about the end of the world, but uh, <laughs> I've, I've probably converted. You know, 30 people over to iPhones and Macs and everything else, you know, over time. Mike, I'm with you. But I waited six hours in line for the first iPhone. And, oh, yeah. and you know what? I, it was worth it because it was a, it was a light year ahead of anything else. Uh, it, was, yeah. it was a breakthrough. But, of course, the first thing that happens is every other smartphone manufacturer looks at it and copies it. That's why Samsung properly, I think, got sued by Apple. But now here we are uh, five years later, and people have gone beyond copying. I think they've improved on the iPhone in a number of ways. And there are a lot of great phones out there. The Windows phones are very impressive. 
I'm an Android fan. I love all the flexibility of Android. Um, there's lots of good choices. Well, I'm I'm looking at the Note too, which I know that you have and love yourself. Yeah, that's and, my uh, that's my phone of choice. That's the Samsung Galaxy Note two. It's available uh, from Verizon, Sprint, and AT and T. Yeah, and and I've been with AT and T for a very long time as well, and I, I'm not not tied to them specifically, but you know I've still got some small concerns. It's not that I've got a lot of money tied up in my iPhone. You know I have bought apps over the years. But as far as, you know, um, you know, upgradability has always been a one thing that I've been so concerned about. You know, with the iPhone, you know, if you can, if your phone can handle it, you can always upgrade to the newest operating system. And then I've heard you even talking about you get some of these Android phones and if they come out with whatever the next great operating system is, it's more based on your carrier getting right. you getting there. Well, for instance, then, I have uh, I have a Galaxy Note 2 and it's uh, it's not 4.2 yet, which is the current. Uh, Android OS, it's still 4.1.1. That's very common in the Android world, but it is a little different in the Android world. You know, the iPhone, um, Apple pushes out the updates, and they usually are significant. In Android, I don't think they're as significant. If you, you've, I wouldn't get an Android phone that's not Jelly Bean. Um, that is, that was a significant jump forward. Uh, in fact, Jelly Bean is the first Android operating system that I think is 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 as good as iOS. But I think it is as good as iOS now. And so I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of a fan of um, Jelly Bean, and I'm a, I'm a fan of the Galaxy Note. I think it runs most of the, you know, early on one of the issues was ecosystem, the app ecosystem. There weren't as many apps. There are now. Uh, Android has, has tied Apple for the number and variety of apps. There are very few apps that aren't on both platforms. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, that would be something to consider if there's an app that you really have to have that's not available uh, on one of the uh, platforms, and that would be an issue. But I don't think it is in general an issue. Um, well, I don't think it will affect me nearly as much because I have an iPad, and I'm not giving up my iPad. I love my iPad. Right. And um, I'd still be in that ecosystem, but I just wouldn't have it for my smartphone. Right. So, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm really, really torn about... Well, it is, and it's a big commitment nowadays because it's basically a two-year commitment. It's like getting married almost. You have to, you're going to be with that phone for a long time, and so that's a little scary. I think you should go to the uh, AT and T store and hold it. Um, my, you know, it is five and a half inches. Now, I don't think that that's particularly uh, uh, unusually large. I don't think I look too goofy even with it to my head, which some people say, "Oh, you're not going to hold that to your head." It's not that big. Uh, it fits in my breast pocket, my shirt pocket, and that's important. Um, you know, that's where I keep my phone. Um, it, it's well made. It's not as well made as the iPhone. The iPhone is like a fine Swiss watch compared to this. Um, but the iPhone dings up like crazy. So you end up putting a case on it that makes it look like a tank. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had a case on every one of them except the first one. Yeah. That's yeah. Alec one. So I think the design of the iPhone while superior, it's kind of hard to sing its praises since you have to put a case on it anyway. Um, I, I, uh, look, I, I, here's my, the reason I like the note, I use my smartphone more as a computer than as a phone. I use it to read articles. I use it to participate in Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I use it as a computer. So the big screen for me is kind of important. I don't use it as a phone all that much. It's a perfectly adequate phone, but it's not the most important thing I do. And frankly, the, the biggest problem I have with the iPhone is my fingers are too fat to type on it, uh, to type accurately on it. And uh, the bigger screen gives you a bigger keyboard. There's also a variety of keyboards. You have a lot more choice in the Android ecosystem. You don't have to use the keyboard it comes with. And there's some really interesting uh, keyboard alternatives that I think are superior. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of friends who have the Android. Now, uh, I, I appreciate your advice. Can I ask you one small other question? Sure. Um, is it possible for somebody to trace an email back to hardware, like if you send an email from the phone, can somebody actually figure out that that came from a specific phone? Like, um, oh, you know, like... Uh, if you can see what email, server... Like, it, well, here's what you can see. You can trace the headers back to the originating server, which will be your phone company. With a subpoena, you could go to the phone company and get the information that you would need to identify the user. So... Uh, a law, well, and then, by the way, currently, 
the the uh, level uh, of um, difficulty in getting this kind of subpoena is very low. It's really not in a subpoena. It's an administrative warrant. And so if you're worried about law enforcement, they can absolutely figure it out. They don't even... They, they uh, I'm have, not worried about... But if you're worried about ex, ex-girlfriends following, figuring out what your phone number is, no, that's not, that's not something that can be done. All right. Thank you much. All right, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, I could talk a little bit about that. Big privacy implications of that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. The header it certainly doesn't it doesn't have your uh, phone number, but does it not have your? Um, it certainly would say what phone company you were using, and with that information, law it would be easy for law enforcement to go into the portal and say, yeah, who sent this one? So that's an interesting question. Are we giving away an iPad? Is this correct? Oh, this is Twit. I'm looking at Twit. No wonder. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, Leo, you're looking at the wrong ads. Twit will give away an iPad. How about that? Stay tuned. Headers sometimes show what also show what email program, right? But that's so you could tell what kind of phone. You, that would probably be the case. Um... Oh, let's get Chris Marquardt on. I don't think... I'll, I'll do the John. That's fine. No problem. I got him. I can do this all by myself. I have the means. We have the technology. I'm using... Uh, some sort of VPN to contact the basement... Switch her over. Thank you, sir. Hello. Hey, Chris. Straight from the basement. <laughs> I'm getting an echo. You are. Wait, let, let me test. Test one, two, three. No, it stopped doing it. I don't know what that is. That's okay. <laughs> Here I am. Photo myth we have a myth about light today. Light myth. A light myth. Oh. The incredible wow. Light myth your, of being. your signal is, is pretty soft. I have to crank this up I'm quite low. a bit. Yes, relatively low. How's that sound? Chris is real high on my end, Leo. Hmm. You sound good to me. Talk to me a little bit, Chris. Let me okay. Look. Well, it's okay now. It's okay now. I just have a lot of, lot of hiss in the signal lots of noise but he's 10 bd db down on my uh, meters here he's not coming to zero or is he still loud to you hmm test one two three I, it's okay That's i mean as bad. long as you guys can hear me i can hear you good enough it's okay da, 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 da. Google Now is coming to uh, the Chrome. That's awesome. I love Google Now. Makes sense that it would. Now is more useful on a smartphone, though. That's the feature where... Um... Oh, this is interesting. I'm using a different launcher. I don't know how I can get to Google Now now. I, I have to go back to my old launcher. Huh. Trying out a, a, a new and interesting launcher, but that's just what is Google now? Oh, it knows where you oh, are. It's, it's a traffic doing. thing. No well, more than that. It tells you your sports scores. Whatever you search uh, for, it'll, it'll give you information. Hold on, here we go. 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. If you hear the Kodachrome song, well, it means it must be time for Chris Marquardt, our photo guy. Hi, Chris. I really love having my own theme. This is awesome. <laughs> Especially one like that. It's a good theme. So, so. Yeah, let's let's bust another myth. All right. He's our for the last few weeks been a photo <laughs> myth buster. We yeah, uh, started I'll keep doing with, this for a while. There's started with so much stuff flare. out there. Yeah, what do you got this time? Well, um when I had my first camera, my dad used to tell me, make sure you have the sun behind you. Right. So the myth is you must have the sun behind you to take good pictures. Sure, and with an Instamatic, that was the only way you'd get a decent picture. Yeah, but it's it's fairly ancient uh, ancient advice. You know, fil film used to need a lot of light. That's one of the reasons. So the more light hit the subject, the better. Right. Um, also, in the old times, lenses didn't have good anti-glare coating or even no coating at all. So you'd get lens flare that was bouncing inside uh, the lens, and um, that would pretty much happen most if you had the sun in front of the lens so that's another reason you can actually see that if you if you look at some of the old cameras they had they had that in their instruction booklets where, where it clearly said keep that sun behind you so there, there were there were quite a few valid reasons back then back in the i'd say 60s but we don't live in the 1960s anymore things have changed quite a bit <laughs> yeah i'm not using a kodak instamatic camera either <laughs> for example yeah and if you look at today's film or sensors digital sensors they are much more sensitive so um the, you don't need as much light anymore that's one thing and then if you look at lenses today they're, they're pretty much all coded in some way and um which which is now a problem for some photographers. You remember a few weeks back we talked about lens flare and how that was one of the other myths that lens flare is so bad. Um, but now some of the photographers actually want the lens flare back to add some specific mood and effect to the picture. And uh, many of the modern lenses don't do that lens flare anymore, even if you have the camera in front of That's the funny. lens. Wow. Uh, is that coatings? How do they do that? Well, it's anti-glare coating. It's pretty, it's very similar to the coating on your glasses. You know, the mm. the the one that helps you not to to see the reflection of your own eye. Right. Um, this is this is a little like like a few molecule layers um, on top of the glass. They put that on in in I think they vaporize metal and then kind of put this on the glass and that. I don't even, don't ask me exactly how it works, <laughs> but it it takes some takes care of some of the reflections. It Sometimes it works. actually adds a bit of like a bluish or greenish tint. You've well, seen was, that. That's probably. one of the reasons I asked. Is uh, I wonder if it affects the uh, the uh, optics uh, a little bit. Well, I, I mean, the main reason they do it is so the light doesn't bounce back and forth inside the lens. Right. So so it, it keeps the lens for out of the lens. But again, right. some photographers really like that. So um, they will actually uh, sometimes use very old lenses that do not have a coating to, to get this specific effect. Sometimes, sometimes you get beautiful aura around the lens. But what's more important is that the depth and the texture, they come from... Uh, from the light being somewhere else than the camera. When, when's the last time you've taken a picture with the with the flash on the camera? Oh gosh, I hate the on camera flash. Yeah, because it flattens everything, and yeah, and depth and texture out. texture are yeah. pretty much pretty much disappear. Yeah. So what you want is you want the light to the side or maybe even behind your subject. And you have you have several benefits from that. Your subject will have a more natural expression because they won't have to squint. Right. If, if they look into the sun, they'll they'll be very squinty, doesn't look very nice. And then the other thing you get from having the sun behind your subject is you get great edge definition. So there's this this very bright edge around the subject, and that adds another depth. Studio photographers will actually deliberately add such a light. Oh, yeah. They will, uh, well, I was thinking of the, of the classic three-point lighting, which uh, in film exactly. and television we use. There's a key light. In fact, we're using it uh, on our video right now. There's a key light, which is uh, the light in front of you. And the weird, by the way, uh, counterintuitive thing about that is the closer the light is, the softer it is, oddly enough, uh, in photography. <laughs> You'd think it'd be harsher, but no. And then there is a fill light, which is from the side. And then, yes. to make sure you don't have, like, uh, shadows. And then... There's a hay, like a, a hay, they call it a hair light. There's a light behind you, and that's what yes. you're talking about that outlines you and makes you stand out. They call out. it a hair light. They call it a rim light. Um, if you have someone with black hair in front of a black background and you don't have a hair light, you won't their see hair it. just disappears right. with the background. Right. They look bald. 
Exactly. So, the, so that, that rim light or hair light will actually add that. And then if you shoot a reflective subject, something like, like a car or a shiny guitar or something, um, the light from behind will actually give it a much more de defined shape. So um, by the way, that's true for anything that reflects even food. If you have a fresh plate of food, don't try to, f to use a flash in the front, but try to move a light source behind right. it and you will be surprised right. how how much depth it all of a sudden has and how much texture it has. There's a great website called Strobist, S-T-R-O-B-I-S-T dot -S com, where he talks about using these little uh, strobe lights that, you, you know, photographers use in interesting and unique ways. But most, photogra most, most of us don't carry around lights, so we have to use the ambient light to get these interesting effects. Yeah, and it's, it's fairly easy. You look around, you look at where the light sources are, and then try to make sure that at least one of the light sources is behind the subject. Uh, there can be some in front, so you have light in the front, but at least one of them behind the subject will give you this beautiful reflection and lots of depth and lots of texture. It's always fun to play with light and uh, get interested. Oh, absolutely. In and then sometimes, and I actually have one of these because they're not expensive, I'll bring a reflector into the field, and that is another way to get a secondary light source if you've got the sun and you can reflect it up into their face and stuff and you can get silver reflectors that are just kind of neutral and you can also get gold usually they're on one on on each side and the gold gives it a lovely warm uh light absolutely yeah uh chris markwart is at chris .com. you can find out more about his workshops at discover the top floor.com in fact everything's there uh, the everest workshops coming up uh, he's got comes to the U.S. every summer. There might be some workshops you'd be interested in for that. And, of course, his great podcast, Tips from the Top Floor, where he talks about photography a couple of times a week, every week. All uh, You know what we're going to do? Discover the Top Floor. I think we agree. That's going to be the easy one. That works best, yeah. 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 Or go to our website. we got a link there at techguylabs.com. <laughs> we have a, a little a photo assignment. I don't want to say competition. Uh, it isn't. It's just an assignment to encourage you to go out and take pictures. Uh, our subject of the, of the uh, month is... It is darkness, and we're getting lots of beautiful darkish kind of pictures, kind so of it's really cool. We we're just talking about light. <laughs> but sometimes you need some light, right? Photography requires some well, light. Well, you know, light, light doesn't work if there is no darkness. You need both, and darkness sometimes even more important. That's some, sometimes I like to call it available darkness photography, and that's what we're doing <laughs> in this assignment. So here's what you do. You get to take a picture, go out and, 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 and take some shots. This is really all that is, is an excuse to go out and take pictures. And then... Upload it to Flickr. That's a free website Yahoo runs. Um, and if you have a Yahoo account, you already have a Flickr account. Otherwise, uh, create a Flickr account. And uh, you will be able to upload it to your site and then cross-post it to the Tech Guy group. You have to be a member. Easy to do. It doesn't cost you anything. Just cross-post it to the Tech Guy group. And, uh, and make sure you put the tag darkness in there so that we will know that this was intended for our photo assignment. And we will have more... Uh, about this next week, and then in a couple of weeks, we will uh, give you a chance to. Uh, there's a lot of dark po photos here. <laughs> we'll give you. A chance. I like them. I, I like love them. it. It's fun, isn't it? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. We'll give you a chance to um, to uh, uh, get yours on the air. It's the weirdest thing I've ever heard on radio. We're going to talk about three photographs <laughs> on the radio. Well, uh, people love it. Absolutely, I love it too. works. It, it yeah. does work. Yep. Darkness is our topic. Upload them. Say hello to Renee when you when you get there. The group administrator she'll welcome you, and uh, you'll be part of the group. Thank you, Chris Markwart. We'll be back next week. All right, see you next week with uh, either another photographic myth, myth busted, or a, a tip, or a tool, or a trick, or something like that. DiscoverTheTopFloor.com. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Let's take some more calls right after this. Yeah, some of these are really fun. Wow, I, I had... It's a I crazy had, world we live in. Were you getting echo back? No, not echo, but uh, there was lots of gating going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Probably, probably I hope, I hope it still worked. You, kind sounded, of. you sounded great. I could tell you were thrown a little bit, but you sounded great. Yeah, I'm just trying. I'm, I'm, I've just looked at my settings. I, do, I have everything switched off here. Yeah, it's just a bandwidth thing. <sighs> okay. Next time. Let's good. see. Well, you sounded, should be good from here. The but, good news yeah. is you sounded fine. That's good. Didn't affect our. That's end. good. Um, I, I noticed the video on this on the screen behind you is fairly dark. Is that anything? Is there anything I can do about that? Well, you're pretty dark. Can you see yourself? I can. Well, I have a preview here. 
My, in my preview, it looks actually looks quite good. Mm. It's a little dim. Don't like that. It's a little dim. What's coming in? Let me uh, crank up the yeah, game a bit. Do, you know what happens, and this is uh, frequently a problem, is I I do change the picture mode on this screen because everybody seems to be uh, looks look a little different. Yeah, I'm, I'm just boosting the gain a bit here. So if I put you in sports mode, then you oh, look, I look I look, look good in sports mode. But it's oh, not okay. what it's not what it looks like uh, on this. Shot. Well, that, no, that shot looks. Yeah, I would boost the gain a little bit. That shot's uh, a little dark. No, it's still not doing it. Uh, no, this That's one is. Right. <laughs> this one That's washes it out. Yeah. Well, you're the photographer. Well, I'm the. Ph <laughs> I need to look good. Oh. Uh, well, we'll see. All right. Thank you, Chris. We'll talk oh. next week. Talk to you next week. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. What would I do without the chat room, huh? <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. Join us in the chat room. You can make uh, comments about the size of my nose. Apparently, that's the topic of the day. <laughs> it's still smaller than Howard Stern's. If you want to join the chat room, go to our website, techguylabs.com. There's a link there. There's also uh, all the information about everything I talk about on this show. I have a nose for radio. Right? Right. Back to the phones. Michael is in Paris, California. Hi, Michael. Hey, Hello. Hi, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. What can I do for you, Michael? Hi, good afternoon, Leo. Thanks for accepting my call. I have an issue that I would really like to get some help with. I have an HP DV7 computer. I attempted to, to use TrueCrypt on a um, USB while multitasking. I goofed that up, but two weeks later, I lost everything on my hard drive. I reinserted another hard drive, reinstalled everything, but now I want to use the original hard drive again. I had used a um, password. I can't remember the password, and I can't get past the um, the the area that would allow me to. So, so the question is, what password are, are we talking about? There's a lot of passwords. There's you can actually have. Uh, well, well, I want to know which password you're talking about. TrueCrypt. There's a password, that, a hard drive password in your BIOS, or are you talking about the Windows password? Which password are you talking about? TrueCrypt. You want to use. To, to, for uh, TrueCrypt. So you, you've TrueCrypted, uh, which is a free open source and excellent, by the way, uh, encryption program. You've got some TrueCrypted data and you don't know the password to it. No, I do not. Then you're out of luck. <laughs> okay. Now That's why that, I recommend that... TrueCrypt. There's no way to get that data. Game over, man. No, I'm not interested in the uh, in the in the data though. I want to reinstall um, Windows back on the oh, hard drive. If you format I, the hard drive, you'll be back to normal. But I I tried that, but that's that's not working. What's happening when you do that? Um, it like it says it's formatted, but once I reinsert the hard drive and boot back up, it's still asking me for a password. Ah, for, for then that a, sounds like you don't have a TrueCrypt password, but you have a hard drive that has a password. Okay. Uh, then how now, do now I... let, me, let me ask, because it may be that the formatting that you did was a quick format that would be perhaps not yeah. low-level yeah, yeah. enough. Yeah. So what you need to do is truly wipe that drive. A quick format does not, in fact, wipe the drive. So, okay. yeah, that's why it's still protecting it because it's saying, whoa, whoa wait a minute, dude. You think that's going to get you in? No way. Oh, so, I, okay. so you need to do a, fur, uh, I would repartition it uh, and then do a deep, a thorough format. And that should, you know, you can wipe it off. There's a great program, too, that we, we don't often talk about, DBAN, D-B-A-N, that will also do a thorough wipe. Uh, it stands for Derek's Booten Nuke. But if you Google DBAN, that's a free program. You need to wipe the drive. Now, if you have locked the drive with a firmware password in BIOS, that's another matter. I don't know if there's any way to get through that at all. That's uh, usually pretty secure. But uh, I, would, I think that all you have to do is uh, delete the partition table, start over, do a deep, thorough scrubbing. That drive should be usable. 
It's just that because you have some partitions left on it, uh, it's seeing it and saying, no, you can't get in. That's why we like TrueCrypt. You want TrueCrypt to, to be robust, strong, and uh, uh, impenetrable. Very good program. TrueCrypt, T-R-U-E-C-R-Y-P-T dot org. If you're looking for a way to encrypt, it's very, very good. Ron in Los Angeles, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Ron. Oh, hi. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. The last time I, I got through, I waited for a half hour and the show was over. Ah, <laughs> these things happen. I apologize. We have far more callers than we can get to. Okay. My, uh, I got a couple of issues here. Uh, the one that I called about first is uh, Perfect Image, which is a, a program that takes a, a picture of the hard drive so that when you see you crash and you go to um, reload the, pro the hard drive, it's perfect. I mean, you know, it has the programs and everything. It's not just the files. Yeah, I, so I, love, uh, I love imaging software. Perfect Image is one of uh, many. It's about 50 bucks from a company called uh, yeah, it, uh, VanQuest. And the idea good. is it images bit for bit the hard drive. It makes a, you know, we used to call it ghosting because the first program that I, most people use was Norton's Ghost. Uh, oh. It makes an image of the hard drive. This is a great way to back up. Now, it's not your only backup solution because it's a pain to make it. You don't want to make an image every day. No, no, no. I, I did that. I do it once every three months. <laughs> yeah. You should have a secondary backup as well so that anything you change in those three months is, is preserved. But what's nice it's about wild. imaging, my, what I do with imaging, I do use imaging, by the way, and I love this. When I set up a system, I do the basic install, I'll make an image. That means I don't have to ever go through the installer again. I just restore that image. Right. Then I install all right. my apps and updates, and I make another image. That's kind of like the finished system. And so it's a very yeah. quick way. We used to do this on the TV show, on the screensavers, because uh, we were, it was a live TV show, and sometimes the computer would die in the middle of a segment. Well, we knew that within the, the, the four minutes of a commercial break, we could restore yeah. the image and have that computer running again. Well, it depends on how many... Um how much of the hard drive that, I mean, how, how big your image is. Yeah, but images are, what, I, what we would always do is we'd have, every computer would have two hard drives, two identical size hard drives. And we'd, we'd, the second one would be for one purpose only, to image the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a really great way to always, so whenever our uh, IT guys, Kevin Rose was our IT guy for a while, whenever the IT guy would come in, he would, uh, you know, make sure everything was clean, set up, no viruses, updates, and then he'd make an image on the secondary drive. And if and it, by the way, doing a live TV show with computers is nuts, especially in 1998 to 2004 era, because they would crash on the air all the time. But we'd say, well, we'll really? be back after this break. <laughs> and by the time we were back, the image was restored. It was great. <laughs> well, but it's, so, on, um, so what, yeah, you having trouble with it? So I, I put the image on the pocket drive. A great idea. But what's, so, so is there a problem? Yeah, when I uh, this time when I tried to load back in the image, uh, when I had a crash, the uh, there was a uh, a corrupt file that was in the image, so when it, it wouldn't put it on, oh. and I had to go to I had to go to an image that was three months earlier, right? And it didn't have the programs that I was really needed. <laughs> So you see, here's the, therein lies the problem, right? Every three months means that in those three months, anything that happens, you could lose something. In this case, you lost more than three months. Um, I'm not sure why uh, that file was corrupted. It must have been corrupted. Well, I mean, these things can happen. You know, a, a program is copying the drive, and as the bits come through the wires, I guess it could get corrupted on the way. I mean, there's no guarantee. Yeah. But there's is no there a program that you could put this uh, image through that would check for a corrupt file? Nah, not really. And this is why I don't recommend imaging as your only backup, because you can't validate the image. Most imaging programs will have a validator, but in a case like this, I don't think there's anything you could have done. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, Kevin Rose is now, uh, he sold his company to Google, Milk, and, um, and is now uh, a... Um, fellow uh, with the uh, Google in a uh, VC arm, Google Ventures. So he's a partner at Google Ventures, um, which is good. That's a good job. That means he uh, he can help entrepreneurs. He, you know, give them some Google money and so forth. Seems like everybody I work with now, or used to work with now works at Google. Do you guys need to take off? No? 
You do? You want to get a picture before uh, you go? This would be a good time to do it. No, you can sit on the ball. I'll put the hat on you. It's kind of a tradition. I know. I don't want to pose. You Canadians are so polite. Wow. That's why I forced them into doing this. You got somebody with a camera? Hey, Michael. How you doing? You coming home with me tonight, huh? Me and Ozzy? All right. Find a good place to sit down. Where in Canada? Uh, London, Ontario. Oh, great. Sister city to London. Yeah, have a seat. Ah. You know I used to go to Toronto one week a month for years. And screensavers was a big deal. Yeah, 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 the tech TV was huge yeah. there, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> awesome, right. thank you. So you're flying home? Were you uh, up for vacation? or? I had a race over at Sonoma. Car, a race? Car wreck, and I had the day off, I thought... So what do you race? Um, two R. We have got two RX sevens. Oh, what fun! Yeah. So was it a Mazda race or was it? It's, a, it's called Chump Car. The, the Chump Car. Yeah. The idea of it is the cars have to cost five hundred bucks. Yeah. So it's just a bunch. Of Are you guys hearing this? This guy does a race called the Chump Car races. Yeah. The cars can't cost more than five hundred bucks. Yeah. But what's interesting is you have like ex pro race drivers, and then you have just. What's fun? Are you a driver? Yeah. I've been racing since I was about eight years oh, old. What fun! And yeah. is where is it? Uh, Sonoma, but we normally race out of Portland and uh, Spokane. Which the racetrack in Sonoma? Uh, it used to be Sears Point, but I think it's oh, Infineon yeah. Speedway now. Yeah. 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 Infineon. Wow. Yeah. That's a nice. That's a nice speed. That's For a speedway. bunch of chumpers, it's a ch yeah. very technical, technical course. So it's sure. a lot of fun. How fun! But your car broke down. Uh, yeah, I had a Miata punt me off, and we hit a wall. <laughs> Those Miatas. I hate those Miatas. <laughs> so I said, oh, funny. forget it. And I, I thought, I'm... So you have a couple of RX-7s. Yeah, we, uh, I'm part team owner. We got two. What fun! Yeah. That sounds familiar. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Patrick's a big car buff. It's easy to get into. Because that's it's an expensive hobby. It's cheap. Yeah. Otherwise. Well, yeah, but 500 bucks for the car, but then... Yeah, there's some people... How much are you allowed to do? Uh... A lot. Have, <laughs> Can you put a new yeah. engine in it? No. Uh, it well, you got to pass tech, and then they ding you. Like, there's some people that show up with kind of like mid '90s BMWs, which are very advanced right. for this class. Right. So they just ding you laps. And oh, okay. To make it competitive, but it's, it's fun. Yeah. It's like I'd love to go see the races. chump car races. Twelve hours. Yeah, we've got a, a You're race insane. up in Portland next year, or Spokane, which is thirty-six. The What's Guinness. That? Get us book of world records will be there too. Oh, that's so cool! For what? What's the record you're gonna break? Uh, 36 hours. I think the current one is 36. Why would anyone want to do that to themselves? Thirty-six hours behind the wheel. You can't get out to pee. Uh, well, you race two hours stints. Two hours. Okay. Yeah. So nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Enjoy. You guys want pictures? Okay. Cool. Oh, I'm, I know what they make in Kentucky. Let's see. Oh, baby, I love Bullet. Oh, my God, I recognized it immediately. I think I saw you some, uh, some Ohio State stuff, some LSU oh, stuff. That's so great. Thank you. UK. UK. You know who's a big UK fan is uh, Ryan Shroud of uh, he lives, Twitch. Uh, yeah, he's a big UK fan. I should have worn this when the Lexington guy called. That's awesome. I'll wear it right now. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> This is Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. This is Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. Hey, Leo. Yes, sir. Hey, Jonathan's been Jonathan Howell has been in 
Go ahead. Jonathan Howell has been in here the last uh, two weeks. He's gonna run this last hour. Oh, good, okay. Oh, good. good luck. But I'll be right here. Good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, and all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion. Love to hear from you. we got a great website, too, techguylabs.com, techguylabs.com. That's where you'll find the show notes. Uh, eventually audio and video of the show so you can hear it after the fact. If you miss a show, don't worry. Not a problem. You can always catch up. It's all free at techguylabs.com. Also a link to our Fabu chat room. Great place to go if you want to participate. The kids in the back of the class. We were talking before the break with Ron in Los Angeles. He's using an image program to make backup copies. And it's, you know, it's it's a good I, the tool, I love it, as a part of an overall backup strategy is not sufficient in and of itself for a couple of reasons. He's found one of them, which is, and I don't like any backup program that you can't look into the backup and see if it worked. That's why I really love the idea of backing up to an external drive, for instance, just by copying or using a file synchronization program like Microsoft SyncToy, because if you look at that external drive, you see all your files. You can open them. You can, you know, randomly check them. You can get a sense that this thing worked. When you're backing up to a big blob, or in the case of an image backup, a, a giant file, there, you, you, most image backup tools, and I'm sure a Perfect Image has this, have a way to browse through that image file. So you can at least open up their browser and see what it got. But it's it's not an ideal solution for uh, backup because, unfortunately, um, uh, it only backs, you know, it's too, it takes so long to do this. It only backs up, you know, whenever you do this, once every few months, in his case, once every three months. And anything that happens in those three intervening three months is lost. So, as I said, what I, here's what I like to do for my backup strategy. I love the idea of having an image so I don't have to do a uh, uh, an install. Windows Installer, actually, it's funny because Microsoft has moved its installer to restoring an image. It's actually using images now on the restore, restore disks. started doing that with Windows 7. So that's why the install got so much faster. An install is slow. A restore from image is fast because all it's doing is blasting the image. Think of the image as a freeze-dried version of your hard drive. All it has to do is blast that back onto the hard drive, and it's exactly as it was the day you did the image. So that's handy. And I, I, as I said, what I like to do when I install Windows is I'll make an image of the first install. And then I'll do all the updates, add the apps that I know I always will want, Microsoft Office, that things like that. And then I'll make a second image. Now, that second image I keep around, that's kind of my Windows installer. But subsequent images are less and less valuable because, they're, you know, the system's getting mucked up over time. You're restoring, in effect kind of a, a, sec, a secondary system. So ideally, the best way to do it, and the way we did it at the screensavers on the TV show, is if I were going to, let's say, make a new image that incorporated new, new features of the operating system, I would start by making a note of all the things that I was, the new features, and then going back to my previous installer disk, the one with all the apps and updates, I'd restore, first thing I'd do, restore the previous installer. So now we're back to the early days of that computer. I do all the updates, so now we've come up to the modern times in terms of you know, Windows Update, install the new features that I want, and make that image. Basically, think of that. that that's what your image is. You should think of your image as an installer, not as a backup. However, it's a good part of a backup because most of the time you don't want to backup Windows and applications and updates. That's not part of your backup. You should. That just makes the backup take too long. From now on, once you've done that image, your backups should be uh, of things that you've added, things that you've changed, not applications, but data. 
So uh, now the next step is to have an external drive or some sort of an external device that is continuously backing up. I use uh, Second Copy. There are a lot of little programs on the Mac. I use Super Duper. It runs every day and just makes all the ch- all the changes that I've made to the hard drive are now copied to that external drive. That external drive, ideally, should be bootable. It should be a duplicate of your internal drive. It's kind of like a secondary copy. That's your near line or online backup. It's always there. It's always available. And then you should have a third strategy because remember, we want three copies of everything. Your third backup should be out to the internet in case. Something really bad happens. The, sturdy, the studio burns down and all the images, all the external drives are all destroyed. I still have a copy in the cloud. Now, that copy is not Windows. It's not your applications. It's just your data. But it's, but it's, it's kind of the last resort so that if the worst happens, you've got a copy of that. Most of the time, what you'll do is, if you, if you want to put a new hard drive in, is you'll restore from that image, the complete image, the most recent image that's a complete image and then you'll reinstall apps that you installed after that and you'll restore your data from the external drive that's most of the time what you'll do and that's like a clean of a great clean install you just want to be careful because those images will copy everything including any viruses errors corrupt files anything that's messed up it doesn't check so i think in ron's case it probably copied a file that was corrupted corrupted files happen all the time and now you don't have a good copy of that. That's why backing up is not its not sufficient just to make images. Images are very useful, but, they're, but they are not a full backup strategy. Sean in Long Beach, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Sean. Sean, are you there? Hi, Sean. Hello? Hey, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Um, I've been a long-time listener. I had a question about uh, networking, Wi-Fi networks. Okay. What I did is my girlfriend and I, we started this little company, and uh, we're starting to make these novelty gifts, and we're starting to ship them out, and we're selling them, and we're packing them up in our garage. How cool. And what I are these to... novelty gifts? I love this. It's, uh, it's called My Modern Mixtape. Oh, that's and, neat. And uh, what we're doing is we're, taking, we're making these, U- these uh, uh, cassette tapes, and there's a uh, USB stick that fits inside. So you put some music on the USB stick, you put it inside the cassette tape, you write a little note on the cover, close it up, and you give it as a gift. I love this idea. So it looks like a cassette. And this yeah. is, if, if you're kind of, if you got, see, we always, when I was a young man, if you liked a girl, you would make her a mixtape, right? And the songs would be chosen to kind of indicate the fact that you kind of liked her. It was a re- exactly. very and nice that- romantic thing to do. But, but, but nowadays, who has a cassette player? Yep, exactly. Nowadays, kids me. today, they just send them a playlist. It's like, come on, that's not romantic. So, <laughs> so this is a good mix. This is a good uh, mixtape uh, alternative. It looks like a cassette, but it's got a USB key in it. Great idea. All right. I like it. MyModernMixtape.com. Now, what can we do to help? Well, um, because I want to, I'm, you know, we're, we're loading these up in, into boxes to be shipped out to some stores and stuff. We're starting to get them into little, little gift shops. Yeah. We're doing that. Garage, and uh, we want to have a Wi-Fi signal that reaches the garage from right. the house. Right. So I want to know what do you recommend for like an access point or something like that, or like a. An I'll tell you the that... easiest way to do this is uh, with something called WDS, the Wireless Distribution System. This is something that is part of the Wi-Fi spec. And what you do is you'll have a wireless access point next to your modem, right? Because you've got a cable modem or a DSL modem. That's where the the, the initial access point has to be. So it's going to be sitting next to it. But maybe it doesn't reach into the garage. Maybe it only reaches three-quarters of the way. What you do is you put a repeater three-quarters of the way where it's going to pick up the signal and boost it and then get it into the garage. Okay. And if you get, for instance, uh, my recommendation is that the repeater be the same manufacturer as the access point. All of them do this. Linksys, Netgear, D-Link. My personal choice is Airport Extreme. With little airport expresses along the way. That's what I do at home. That's a little more pricey, but I get great results. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. La, 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 la. Our show today brought to you by my good friends at Citrix. They've been with us since, let's see. 
Citrix has been an advertiser since... I want to say 2004, but I think it even goes farther back than that. I think it goes back to screensavers days. Great relationship with them. And the reason is simple. They These guys are great. They know their market. They know their products. They acquire new products to increase, to you know, improve the uh, the product all the time. They give uh, very good value um, for the money. I'll give you an example. Go to meeting. I don't have meetings anymore without go to meeting. Go to meeting makes it easy to set up a meeting. You just click a link. In your email and the invitations go out, includes a conference bridge, so you got audio. Or you can use VoIP that's built into the GoToMeeting app. Most of the people do that. But here's a nice thing. you At the same time as you're having their meeting, if you want to show the screen, you want to show them a PowerPoint presentation or you're working on a document together, it's easy to show the screen and collaborate. And now GoToMeeting's gotten better and better. Now you can present from an iPad. You can attend meetings on your iPhone or your Android device. And they now have video built in. It's called HD Faces, and that's really slick. So now you're not only seeing the screen, but you're seeing your attendees. They're seeing you uh, via the camera with the people moving all over the place, teams distributed all over the world. Uh, the holidays coming, people going home early. Go to meeting is a really great tool. I'll tell you, it's so cool to have go to a meeting on the iPad, and the camera on the iPad is getting an image of you. Uh, your sound is coming from your iPad, your microphone on the iPad, all of that. And now you're meeting. With distributed teams, this is a must. This really is a must. I want you to try it free for 30 days. Visit gotomeeting.com and use the promo code TECH and you get 30 days free. Gotomeeting.com, promo code TECH. Then download the free app on your iPhone, your iPad, your Android device, and you can uh, hit the road and have meetings anywhere you are. Share screens, share drawings, collaborate, training. It's fantastic. Go to meeting.com. And if you do this, click the uh, click the uh, link that says promo code. And please, if you will, put in the word tech so they know where you heard it. Really is amazing. Love these Citrix folks. They're nice, too. Michael Guarnieri and his team down in uh, Santa Barbara. They come up and visit a lot. Big fan. Big fan. We crashed the mixtape site. I'm sorry. <laughs> of course we did. <laughs> of course we did. <laughs> Galaxy S3 is easy to root. Um, just go to uh, um, the uh, forum. What is it? The A8? A, I can't remember the name of the forum. They'll tell you. The chat room will tell you. I want to say XDA. That's it. Go to xda-developers.com. Go on the forums and that, just search for your device, your specific device, and be very specific. Say it's the AT&T uh, Galaxy S3 and all that. And uh, it's easy to root. I rooted my Galaxy S3. It's trivial. Once you're rooted, it's very easy to put ROMs on it. Dick loves his soda stream Z speed. Seems a little pricey for what you're getting, but... I guess it's cheaper than soda. We did not do an inside twit this week. We ran out of time on Wednesday. We were so late because of me. Matt Cutts' Skype got hacked. Oh, no. Poor Matt Cutts. Uh, it does not void your warranty when you root it. Rooting, though, has some other consequences that you may not love. For instance, updating it after you root it sometimes is tricky. Leo Laporte, rocking and rolling with the Who. Now, see, don't put this on your mixtape. This is a song about jealousy. This is not a good song for your mixtape unless you're trying to break up with somebody. I can see for miles. I know what you did. Actually, I just read Pete Townsend's um, autobiography, Who I Am. And he talks about this song. It's one of the first songs that he uh, wrote. And it was motivated by jealousy over his wife. He thought he thought she might be stepping out on him. And he wrote this. He was very jealous. <laughs> don't put that on your mixtape. Of course, if, you know, people don't know that story, they probably just think it's a good song. Baba O'Reilly, there's a good one. That's a good one for the mixtape. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Don is in Aurora, California, our next caller. Hi, Don. Actually, it's Aurora, Colorado, but that's okay. I'm sorry, Colorado. Yeah, of course. That's right. So I have a question. I have a pavilion 
uh, HP Pavilion DV7, and I'm trying to get Bluetooth connected to it. Now, I thought that the Bluetooth would be part of just the wireless uh, device itself. Um, it is on my Lenovo. Um, yeah. Uh, but it, is, it, is it not the case on the HP? Sure it is. Why? What's going on? It, when I go in to add to add a device, it's not finding any Bluetooth device that I have. It doesn't show up anything. And when I oh well, maybe you, know, you don't I have need... Bluetooth on that laptop. Not all laptops have Bluetooth. Does it say it's supposed to have Bluetooth? I thought that when I got it, I thought that they told me the HP Pavilion DV7 did have Bluetooth. HP. Let me look and see. Uh, I'm not. So there's a I'm couple getting... of there's a couple of possibilities. One, it may, is it a desktop or a laptop? It's a laptop. Yeah, it's I mean, pavilion. most laptops should have Bluetooth, but the Pavilion is not HP's. You know, it's their inexpensive laptop, and it may be that it it left it out, uh, or that that was an option. In fact, I'm seeing in the chat room a lot of people have DV7s that don't have Bluetooth. Really? Yeah. So maybe you didn't get it. The other possibility is that the drivers are missing. Right. Did you did uh, when you first got it? Did you try Bluetooth, or is you just trying it now for the first time? I'm just trying it now. I got it about three months yeah. ago, and I've had some thumb surgery, so I wasn't. Got it. Um, with, there is I'm a no switch, I believe, on this laptop that disables the radios. <clears throat> right. Well, and the question is, which fun, which F key is it going to be? And that's <laughs> for me. Cause I can't visually, tell I have no vision, so I can't look at the key ah. layout. Ah. All right, let me ask the chat room, because a bunch of them have DV7s. What is the yeah, funct the function key for the well, uh, Bluetooth to turn it off and on? Yeah, I'm just wondering what it might be. Yeah. You could also, of course, look in the device manager. You right-click on My Computer, select Properties, click the Device Manager tab, and see if uh, it even has Bluetooth built in. Uh, I looked in the manager and i i see quite a few different intel things but i didn't see anything that jumped out with yeah, a it, title of you, you may have one that just doesn't have bluetooth all right i have an hp pavilion i'm looking on the hp forum thanks to the chat room i have an hp pavilion dv7 it appears i have an intel centrino uh wireless bluetooth 3.0 high speed devices in my hardware section so that's what you're looking for intel centrino right. wireless bluetooth 3.0 uh but where do i turn it on click start Enter HP Wireless in the search field. That's going to be the HP Wireless which Assistant. I did, and HP Wireless doesn't even show up, which is odd. I mean, I kind of because I went out and read that this morning, and I went to start and typed in HP Wireless, and HP Wireless does not bring up anything. Huh. Huh. That sounds like you know you. If you haven't used this much, I would try restoring from the restore discs. Did you build those restore disks? I did. Okay. I would try restoring from the restore disks just to make sure you got everything on there. And uh, you, the HP wireless should run. I mean, it's that that's supposed to be on the computer whether you have Bluetooth or not. Right. That's what I kept thinking. Now, I mean, I have wireless because I'm on yeah. the you know, I'm cruising. At, yeah, so it, it sounds to me like maybe some of the software is not there. I wonder if the HP wireless is something I can go out and get as a if it's part of the software if I'm missing just that piece. Possible. Uh, HP has a software and drivers download section. Yes. So if you go there, let me just check real quickly. Let me see what we can see. Driver, right. audio, chipset. Uh, yeah, you get. You probably were going to want to get the chipset drivers. Because that it's the Intel chipset installation utility and driver that will make sure you have the right hard, uh, chipset. So that's where the Bluetooth is going to live. And I'm just looking mm -hmm. to see if operating system enhancements, software solutions. They have quite a bit of utilities. The quick launch, uh, recovery manager. I'm sure that. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, some of those stuff isn't very accessible. Yeah, it's of course twice as hard because you can't see the screen. Yeah. Yeah, well, some of it is web design, and some of it is then you get into the HP utilities, and they're horribly coded. Yeah. I mean, they have unlabeled buttons and, you know, images with no labels, and that's the actual software on the PC. I, yeah. It's ridiculous. And there's nothing much you could do. There is uh, an HT, HP uh, driver, the Intel Bluetooth 3.0 HS enabler. Um, 
that is a download. We'll put a link to that in the uh, website, the website techguylabs.com. That would be the most direct uh, place to download something. That's for the uh, Centrino Wireless. This might give you the, the tools that you need. And, of course, it's called HP. You're still under warranty. Yeah, I am. Um, I know. it's a lot, As hard as it is to get through the tech guy and as long as you spend on hold, it's still better than going to HP. Right. Well, and, well, you know, sometimes there's communication issues, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, a lot of times they don't, when, you, when they find out that you're visually impaired, they think automatically you don't know what you're doing. Right. Right. That's very frustrating. Oh, of course it is. I actually am an accessibility evangelist. That's what I do. So Good man. Go. What do you That's recommend? Right. What, what do you recommend for a screen reader these days? I use, I don't know, I use, you know, I use a lot of them. I use JAWS probably more than any because when I, the company I work for, I mean, you have to realize that, you know, 85, 90% of the market share goes to that, that product. So As expensive as it is, there are a couple of open source attempts like Orca There's to... free one I use in VDA, which is a good free one. Yeah. Um, uh, that's actually made by two guys in like Australia or New Zealand or someplace. But so good. So when people call, because I often I'd say well, Jaws, but it's what it's fifteen hundred bucks. I tell people yeah, uh, right. there are, there are open source solutions. NVDA, good. That's the one I'll recommend. Yep. Yep. Non visual desktop access is what it stands for. Great. Hey, it's good, um, to, Don. Keep listening, and if I ever, I, you know, we get a lot of calls uh, because it's radio that we have a lot of blind listeners, but we get a lot of calls about assistive sure. technologies. And anytime you uh, you got a uh, tip for us, I'd love to hear from you. Well, that's what I do. That's that's you know, awesome. I, part of my job. Dom, hang on the line, and Gina, if you would, would you get his email address so that I can uh, I can stay in touch? I appreciate that, Don. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Take care. Yeah, that's sure. a, that's that's really frustrating. You know, I'm not a big fan of HP computers because a they load it up with a lot of junk, a lot of trial wear and so forth. Uh, but b also, the, you know, I I I question their support commitment to support and so forth. Nobody does a great job, frankly, with support anymore. Um, but HP seems to be a laggard even then. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So Kaepernick is still our uh, guy. <laughs> Oh, you like the new iMac, do you, tech dude? You got the skinny one? It's a nice computer. Ah, that's nice. So the factory discs have an image without the crapware. That's nice. Windows key X. All right. Yeah, we talked about that on Security Now, Trucky. Isn't that funny? John McAfee was in Guatemala. He uh, did an interview, and the guy doing the interview took a picture of him with his camera phone, posted on the website. The EXIF information had the GPS. <laughs> he got arrested. <laughs> He's in jail in Guatemala, waiting extradition to Belize. I really want to buy the uh, 27, but it's not out till uh, well, when's it come out? I need a skinny iMac to replace my thick iMac. January, jeez. January. All right, let's see. Let's go with the 3.2 gigahertz i7, 3.4 gigahertz. All right. Let's go with 16 gigawites of RAM. Uh, oh, I want to do a fusion drive, right? Definite. Well, we want to do the G4 680. You, you bet, because I'm going to be playing Skyrim. Don't want a magic mouse. Don't need a magic mouse. Don't like the magic mouse. What's the Apple mouse? I don't even know what the Apple mouse is. I might get a magic trackpad. Wireless keyboard in English. I don't need pages, numbers, or keynote. I don't want Apple Care. I don't want one to one. Do I need Thunderbolt? I don't think so. I don't want a super drive. I don't want a battery charger. 
external Thunderbolt storage, time capsule, or Apple TV. Nor do I want a printer. Twenty-nine forty-nine. I need to spend it now because uh, for tax consequences, we want to spend our money now. Yeah, I think there's manufacturing issues. You bet. You bet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Bart's in uh, Yucaipa, California, our next caller. Hey, Bart, Leo Laporte here. Hey, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you. My son is going to be starting uh, college next year, and I'd like to help him out with a laptop. Awesome. My son, uh, too. That's great. Does he know where he's going yet? Yeah, he's going to go to Walla Walla University and uh, take uh, engineering. Awesome. Very good school. That's great. So uh, that's important, too. He's going to be an engineering major. All right. Yeah, so I'm assuming he wants uh, PC versus um, Mac. And uh, I'm wondering, of course, what um, laptop would be good for him. And then also, do I want like a Windows 8 with a touch screen or is like Windows 7 fine? That's a great question. So first thing I would do is call both the school, call the bursar at the school or the school uh, bookstore and see a, what they recommend, what people use, and what they have deals on. And often, often the school bookstore will have deals for incoming students. I would also have your son call the engineering department and talk to them and get their recommendations. While I agree with you, Windows sounds like the right thing, they may have another opinion. So uh, I, I, would, uh, I would definitely you know, get him. This is a good excuse for him to talk to them anyway. All right. Say call call the chairman of the department or one of the professors and say, "Hey, I'm I'm an incoming freshman. I'm going to be majoring in engineering. Nice to meet you. I got a couple of questions. First of all, what computer should I bring?" Uh, and they usually these guys are you know don't call them during exams like right now, but uh, <laughs> but usually these guys are very helpful. Uh, I would think you're right. I think it's a PC. I would suggest a Windows Seven PC. Uh, I'm not I'm not against Windows Eight. But most of the programs he'd be using, in fact, all of them, will be Windows 8, 7 programs. They won't be Windows 8 programs. Okay. Uh, you know, Metro, Windows 8, the big difference between Windows 7 and 8 is really that start screen and the Metro interface and the ability to run Metro programs. No serious program is going to be Metro. They're all going to be desktop programs. So okay. I would say there's no reason to get Windows 8. And uh, I don't, A, I don't think he's going to benefit from touch. And B, I don't think he's going to be using Metro apps. Um, so definitely get seven, but, uh, okay. but, but that's my opinion. You really should ask the engineering department. Uh, they may say, well, we, uh, we're going to be planning to use a new Metro version of AutoCAD. So you'll definitely want windows eight. I don't know. I don't know. Um, as for what brand, well, uh, it's a little tricky with a laptop. Now I think you're right. I think for a student, a laptop is smart cause it takes up less desk space. It can be put away, you know, Rooms uh, are it's tight in rooms, but the uh, college rooms. But the problem is also that they're easily stolen. So um, you know, if your son is a good, responsible uh, person and is going to keep an eye on that thing and lock it up when he's not in the room and not leave it lying in the uh, library when he goes to the bathroom, stuff like that, then you're probably all right. If not, you might want to get a Kensington lock. All of the laptops have a little Kensington port. This lock plugs right. into it, and you put it around the desk leg. It's not going to stop somebody with wire cutters, but it's going to stop somebody just walking by and saying, hey, that's a nice laptop. I think I'll take it home. Yeah. Um, I personally, um, I'm a fan of Lenovo. Uh, I think they're good, solid laptops. The next question is, does he want light and portable, or does he want a desktop replacement? And my suspicion, if he's going to be running high-end engineering programs, is he really is going to want a desktop replacement running an i7 processor, eight gigs of, at least 8 gigs of RAM, um, and in that case, Dell, uh, Lenovo, maybe, but uh, Dell certainly, um, uh, Asus, ASUS makes very nice, less expensive laptops. Um, you're gonna, you know, you want a kind of a higher end laptop, I suspect. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Lee. But uh, yeah, I would definitely call it. You know, have him do it too. All right. It's a good. It's a good. It's good. This is all a learning experience. You got to prod him. Say, "I'll get you a laptop, but your assignment is to call the engineering department and find out what they recommend." 
That's interesting. Dell Dell has discontinued Windows 7 laptops except for gaming machines. Wow. That's kind of... Uh, I don't know if that... I bet you anything you can ask for Windows 7 and they will give you Windows 7. Bet you anything. Um, now, the other consideration for an, a student going to school is this may also be, and this depends on you know your point of view, this may also be their entertainment system, their home theater system, in which case a big screen, you want to bring separate speakers, you want to be able to play Blu-ray discs. There are some additional features you may want if this is going to be not merely his you know schoolwork tool, but this is his television set. And I think for most kids going to college, that's fine. You probably don't need a printer. Almost all universities now have printers in the dorms that are on the network you can print to. Uh, but again, that's one to ask. Uh, he might he, He's probably going to visit the school, I would guess, at some point. He might ask kids at the school, hey, should I bring a printer or not? Um, I think that's, that's everything. But really get some input from the, from the school. A, you can get a discount usually at the, at the college bookstore. And plus, they may have support there, which you probably want. Uh, and B, you want to find out exactly what the engineering department specifically, since that's where he's going, would recommend. Steve in Orange County. Good luck. That's really great, Bart. My, my son uh, is going to school. He won't be studying engineering. He'll be studying partying. But he'll be going to uh, college in the fall. Um, he's really good at partying. I think he's picking something that he's excellent at and he wants to focus on. But I'm hoping he may broaden his horizons a little bit once he gets there. <laughs> Actually, Hank's very interested in music. He wants to uh, the, one of the one of the schools he wants to go to, Chico State, has a very good music industry program. He's already got into Arizona State, so uh, they have a they have a great physics department. He's very interested in sciences as well. So it's it's exciting. It really is. It's a be- beginning of a whole new uh, era for our kids when they head out to university. Steve in Orange County, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Steve. Hi, Leo. How are you today? I am well. Oh, great. Thank you for taking my call. Thanks for calling. Um, I, also want to, I know it was last year, but I want to say thank you and uh, congratulations on getting your hand license. Yes, I am W6TWT. What's your What's your call sign? Oh, I don't want to say it right now. <laughs> okay, you can be anonymous. Yeah, but, uh, but here's, here's my question, though, uh, about cameras. Um, I'm interested in finding a nice compact camera where I can stick my breast pocket or uh, jacket pocket. Um, something that has um, quick, uh, where you can take quick pictures um, instead of waiting for it to process. Yes. Um, yes. For low light. Okay. Um, okay, that's an interesting question. You know, the cameras have gotten faster. It used to be one of the drawbacks of digital photography was you'd press the shutter button and wait. But they have gotten faster. So now we don't look so much at shutter lag. That's less of an issue. Almost all the good ones have good sh- have very quick shutter response but you sounds like you also want pocket to picture time which is how long it takes to go to turn on yes and every time i snap a picture like an action picture my son is in taekwondo oh yeah and i'd like (laughs) quick uh pictures and uh goes quickly so that's so okay so you mean burst mode the ability to go boom 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 boom? yeah i think that's what it's called yeah burst mode yeah, we used to call it motor wind because you'd have uh, with film cameras you'd have a a motor beneath it that would go gee 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 gee. Well, now they're burst right. mode, and so you're going to be. So here's I'm going to tell you a site you can go to to, to find out all these specs, um, and and I'll give you some cameras, but uh, but you might want to check the specs on all of them. So you're going to look for shutter lag. You want a very low, almost instantaneous shutter response. You're going to look for on power on time. That's how long it takes for you to pull it out, you know, to draw it out of the pocket and take it until you're ready to take a picture. And you're going to look for burst mode and how many frames per second. That has a lot to do with the speed of the camera and the speed of the memory. Typically, it's five or six frames a second. That's certainly enough for Taekwondo. But you also said something important, low light. I'll talk about that when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yes, I have burst mode on my ball, <laughs> as we know. When we built the new Tech Guy Labs, we wanted to do as much as we I'm thinking, uh, should I, S900? I didn't ask him budget. Um, I mean, S, well, now it's S110 or something, right? Um, let me just look at this, the specs on that. And then we, li- we love the Nikon. 
He wants compact, obviously, uh, he said. So we're obviously not going to... Yeah, the PowerShot one, S110. This is a nice, very compact camera. But let me look at the specs on this here. It's 24 to 120 optical zoom 5x. Let's see what the uh, sensor size is. Not huge. None of these are. F2. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <sighs> Two point one frames a second, that's pretty good. Does shoot video and stereo sound, which is nice. I don't see in specs, I don't see maybe this is uh this looks like it's Canon's specs as opposed to tests. I'd like to know what the turn on time. Hmm. Cybershot RX100, huh? Let's look at that one. It is a small sensor. This has a much bigger sensor. 20 megapixels. Boy, this is a nice looking camera, this new one. Wow, I'm going to have to order this one. Uh, yeah, he wants a compact camera, so the uh, NEX is probably not a good choice. But this RX, RX 1000 sounds pretty good. Much larger uh, sensor. You like that? You like this one? I like some specs. What's the price on this? Whoops. Ooh, it's pricey. Six hundred fifty bucks. It's a good. It's in the point and shoot range. It's uh, pretty good. F one eight. That's fast. That's nice. This actually does sound like a better choice. What was the burst mode? Hmm, doesn't say. Yeah. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're talking about digital photography. And it's a boy, that's, I tell you, that's a moving target, isn't it? Our caller uh, son does uh, martial arts. So he wants something that's fast but compact. He wants to be able to keep it in his pocket. So it's a point and shoot. Uh, he wants to have a high frames per second, low shutter lag, and good low light performance. Now, the problem is, and good, oh, he's in chat. That's great. I, we, I've, I've lost his call, but that's fine. We'll, the problem is that I don't know what his budget is. Uh, sorry, Web374. Uh, what's your budget? Because that's, that's if, if price is no object, I think we in the chat room have agreed the Sony Cybershot DSC RX100 is a very good choice. But that's 650 bucks, And he says, no, I'm more like uh, 300 bucks. 650 bucks for a point and shoots quite a bit, but this has some advantages. It's got very good low light performance. Now, typically, lo low light performance that is, perf and by the way, anything but broad daylight is considered low light. Indoors is low light. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a kid blowing out candles on a birthday cake. It could be, um, in fact, martial arts is a very good example. 
you need to have very good sensitive sensors in a picture in a in a uh, camera you're going to take sports pictures with because in order to freeze the motion you need to turn the fr the uh, shutter speed up so a high shutter speed means you're not letting as much light in one five thousandth or one one thousandth of a second not as much lights coming in so that means you need to be able to increase the aperture the opening to compensate and you want a sensor that is very good low light performance. You might even need to turn up the ISO. So uh, the good thing about the uh, RX100, and this is very unusual in a point and shoot, is it has a fairly large sensor, larger than most. It's in a one inch sensor. That's that's pretty big. 13.2 by 8.8 .8 millimeters. And it's got a very uh, good low light performance. It goes down to f1.8, which is surprising. So this would be an this would probably be my choice for you if money were no object because it's so fast uh, that you would be able to get those those shots. Where did I get those specs, by the way? Uh, DPReview.com this is a great site for camera digital photography reviews. I like it a lot. Uh, they have lots of specs. Um, an S100 from Canon is very compact, very small, very nice. Um, and would be a little less expensive, especially since the S110 has come out. So they'll you'll see some discounts on the S100. Um, I'm trying to, you know, $300 price range is a pretty good price range these days for a camera, for a point and shoot. But some of the things you want are higher end, expensive um, features, things like Good low light performance is going to cost you. Uh, Toronto Mario points out that another site that I love, digitalcamerainfo.com, is also a great place to go for reviews. What I would suggest is go to these sites. Now you know what you're looking for, which is small, almost instantaneous shutter lag, uh, high frames per second. The S110, for instance, 2.1 frames per second. That means burst mode. You could take boom, boom, boom pictures, two pictures a second. Um, and then you can also uh, uh, get a pretty low light performance. You want it, we want good low light performance. That means uh, the biggest sensor you can afford. Big sensors usually mean bigger cameras, more expensive cameras, and uh, a low f rating, the lowest f stop. Uh, well, I've never seen a point and shoot go down to 1.8. That's pretty low. Typically, the best I've seen is two or 2.4. Lower is better in that case. So uh, digitalcamerainfo.com, another good place to go to get uh, reviews. You can browse by brand. You can look. In fact, they have. it's a good site because they have a, a finder where you can enter in, I believe. They have a place where you can enter in your specs that you're looking for, and they'll give you some choices. That's kind of what you want. So you can browse by type, brand, price, or uh, need. So you'd look for sports and action and see if you could find something that fits your need there. The Olympus XZ1 does f1.8. That's a good camera, too. That's an excellent camera. Well, he's in the chat room. I'm sure he'll get a lot of uh, suggestions from the chat room. Enrique in San Diego, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Enrique. Hey, Leo. It's great to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. Um, I, I've been watching most of your shows. They're all, all really good. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the Sprint Nextel network. Yeah. We heavily rely on this service. Um, I live in the San Diego area, and uh, me and my relatives and most of my friends, we cross the border all the time, uh, sometimes two to three times a week. And uh, we talk to each other using Nextel's uh, radio service. Uh, but this service is going away uh, starting uh, next year. Right. So we need to find a replacement for this service. The, the next you... Sprint bought Nextel, and uh, the Nextel uses its own network, which Sprint is phasing out. And yeah. uh, the whole point of Nextel was this push-to-talk feature. You saw the ads until recently. They were still running ads. And so it's like a walkie-talkie in addition to a phone. You can program in a few other Nextel phones, and you can talk to them directly. Yes. And, uh, and it's, just, it's just great. Um, boy, I, got, I, I don't know... They are, you know, doing push to talk on Android, but it's not quite the same. Um, yeah, the best thing about this Nextel service is that with a fixed rate of about fifty dollars, you're able to go across uh, Mexico, the U.S., anywhere, yeah. and there's no roaming charges, and you can receive and make calls 
of like that. But uh, if this is going to be gone pretty soon, um, I don't know if there's going to be a replacement. It's probably why it's going to be gone, because <laughs> it was cheap. What I would I would do is look for an app that can run an iPhone or Android that will give you that functionality. There's one called Zello, uh, Z-E-L-L-O, and it uses data. So it's going to be affordable because you're not making phone calls. Um, it's available for Android, iPhone, and BlackBerry. In fact, you might like it better than Nextel because it also works on computers. So I can be sitting on a computer and make a Zello call. Um, the app is very much like the, a walkie-talkie or a Nextel phone. You, it's it's free. The app is push to talk, um, and uh, I think this is. The, there are other programs like this, but I think this is the best known. So, if well, you have a friend with an iPhone or an Android phone or a BlackBerry, you might want, or you could actually download the desktop. You might try it and take a look. Z e l l o. It's free for the app. But I would suspect that what happens is that there you 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 know you can pay for uh, more. I'm not sure how that works, but there's a there's it's interesting. They've even got little networks of people that are talking to each other. It's kind of like the new ham radio. So uh, Z E L L O. Sprint says they're going to do some sort of push to talk, but they're going to use it over LTE, their uh, new data network, and that's been slow to get going. So I think they're going to. I think there will be a period of time in between phasing out Nextel and Iden and, uh, and having it available on Sprint, which is unfortunate because I think there are a lot of people who find it very useful and convenient. Thanks for the call, Enrique. Thanks for joining me. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows and Windows Weekly, Macintosh and Mac Break Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today and our weekly roundtable show this week in tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.